just let's just bump up again. Join the meeting. I'm worried about being able to vote if I can't. I'm going to try and reboot one more time here. Chris, we're going. Welcome. My name is Chris Lunch. Tonight we're starting with a couple, three uh, public hearings. I declare these public hearings open. Now is the time and place for the public hearing on the district's proposed fiscal year 2017 certified budget and setting the tax rate. The Board of Directors set the date for this public hearing on March 8, 2016. Notice of public hearing was published in the Iowa City Press Citizen on March 28, 2016. Are there any questions from the board related to the certified budget and setting the tax rate? Are there any questions from the public related to the certified budget and setting the tax rate? Moving on. Now is the time and place for the public hearing on the proposed plans and specifications for the 2016 City High School Upper Practice Field Project. The Board of Directors set the date for this public hearing on March 22, 2016. Notice of public hearing was published in the Iowa City Press Citizen on March 23, 2016. The district will receive bids on this project at 2.30 p.m. April 28, 2016 at the Educational Service Center located at 1725 North Dodd Street, Iowa City, Iowa, 52245. Notice to contractors was published as required by law in the Iowa City Press Citizen on March 23, 2016. Are there any questions from the board? Are there any questions from the public? Now is the time and place for the public hearing on the proposed plans and specifications for the 2016 10-plex modular move to Lucas Elementary School project. The Board of Directors set the date for this public hearing on March 22, 2016. Notice of public hearing was published in the Iowa City Press Citizen on March 23, 2016. The district will receive bids on this project at 2 p.m. April 14, 2016 at the Educational Services Center located at 1725 North Dodge Street, Iowa City, Iowa, 52245. Notice to contractors was published as required by law in the Iowa City Press Citizen on March 23, 2016. Are there any questions from the Board? On this 10-plex, uh, uh, this is our second move with it, is that correct? Yes. Actually, we're our third. It's, it's third? Yeah, okay. it went from uh, Twain to Corville Central, then to Lurkus. Okay. And uh, as far as historically our costs when we're moving it, how are they going? Are they trending pretty much the same? I think they're comparable. They? The difference is the site. Sure. You know, the site at Corville Central was much steeper than Twain, and the site at Lucas is much steeper than Corville Central. So okay. it requires more foundation work. And, but other than that, I would say the moving costs are about the same. Very good. Can you just remind me, um, the reason we're moving the 10-plex to Lucas is to do the renovations at Lucas? That's correct. Okay. How many classrooms are going to be out of commission at one time? Just curious. Well, we're actually moving the 10 plex and we're moving three small units that we have. So uh, ten, there's already a duplex that's there. So there's 12 full-size classrooms, three what I'd call half-size classrooms, and they'll be in use the entire time. So at any given time, there'll be 13 to 15 classrooms out of commission. I'm just curious because my, if I'm remembering correctly, Lucas is a little short on classrooms anyways, right? I mean, it's, it'd it's be very, nice if we had some more rooms there. It is. It's very, very tight. <coughs> But this won't necessarily give us more rooms because we're going to be taking as many rooms out of commission as we are adding. That's correct. Okay. Are there any questions from the public? Okay. Thanks, Brian. I declare these public hearings closed. Welcome to the Iowa City School Board meeting on April 12th. My name is Chris Lynch. I call this meeting to order. 
I'd like to thank those in the audience and those on TV for taking an interest in our district business. I'd like to start tonight by introducing those at the table with me here tonight. To my right is Superintendent Steve Murley and Directors Lori Rowland, Phil Hemingway, Brian Kersling, Latasha Talosh, Tom Yates, Chris Liebig, and Recording Secretary Kim Colvin. The public is reminded if you wish to speak to complete a speaker form found at the table in the lobby and turn it in during community comment. Persons may speak to the board about topics relevant to the district. All community comment directed at not agenda and non-agenda items shall take place at the beginning of the meeting during the community comment section of the agenda. And first up tonight is Hoover groundbreaking, Steve. Yes, yeah, so uh, we had the uh, wonderful opportunity to uh, break ground at Hoover. Uh, and uh, just a little bit about uh, uh, Hoover itself. Uh, it's a 500 student school. Uh, it will be complete by the fall of 2017. I'll talk to you a little bit about what we're going to do uh, with the school after we move in in the fall of 17. Uh, those of you that have been to uh, Alexander and Borlaug will recognize the design uh, given the layout of the space uh, on the property. We have a, a design that looks very similar to that uh, with a two-story building with 25 full-size classrooms. Uh, one of the things that's a little bit different about it is we'll have a uh, concrete storm shelter there. Uh, and that's part of new building codes uh, that are required for schools, and that's certainly going to be a wonderful refuge for our kids if and when we have one of those events. Uh, in 2017-18 uh, and then 18-19, Hoover will serve as a transition schoolhouse. Uh, first, it will house students from Longfellow while we go through renovations there, and then Lincoln and Mann Elementary Schools in 2018-19. Just a reminder that uh, when we went through the process of looking at redesign in Longfellow, Lincoln, and Mann, uh, we had concerns about uh, doing uh, renovations in uh, multi-floor buildings that were relatively small and being able to do so in a way in which we were able to keep students and staff safe uh, and also provide them a learning environment that was effective and uh, wasn't necessarily marred by noise and dust and other su uh, such things. And so that's why we decided to move each of those schools out for that year while we could get in behind them and get that work done. also allows us to accelerate that work. So then in 2019-20, uh, Hoover will get its own... Uh, uh, population of uh, neighborhood students as it opens as a neighborhood school. Uh, we had the opportunity to gather with uh, many members of the general public and some local elected officials. Uh, although I'm not wearing a coat there, that's just because I wasn't as smart as uh, Mayor Throgmorton and President Lynch because it was a cold, blustery day out there. Uh, a little difficult to hear with the, uh, the wind howling and the microphones. Um, you might notice there's a two by four on the front of the uh, uh, podium there, six. two by six, uh, and that was to make sure that it didn't blow over during the uh, midst of the uh, celebration. Uh, so we did have the opportunity uh, to uh, gather with some kids who are uh, living across the street who are going to be part of the uh, new crew of students there, and uh, we broke some dirt. Normally uh, you'd get a nice picture of us throwing dirt, uh, but I gave the kids instructions that we merely were going to turn the dirt over so that it didn't fly into the faces of the audience, which was downwind from us as we were shoveling. So all in all, great opportunity uh, to celebrate uh, uh, forward movement in the district and uh, the opportunity to generate some new classroom space uh, on the east side. A big, Kristen. Beautiful spring day in Iowa, no doubt. Hey, Steve, can I ask you a quick question? Um, 25 full-size classrooms, seven smaller classrooms. Those smaller classrooms, what uh, that's, do you mean? Are they kindergarten size or are they too small? Even no, those are uh, actually specialized learning uh, classrooms. So you're looking at uh, ELP, uh, sorry, extended learning program classes or English language learner classrooms or special education classrooms. Preschools maybe? Uh, not preschool. It would be, yeah, they'd yeah. be smaller. Uh, usually those kindergarten and preschool classrooms are actually a little bit bigger uh, than our regular classrooms, and so uh, we're really looking at specially designed but, instruction. But ordinary uh, classroom, K-6, those are just the 25. That's correct. All right, thanks. Steve. Next on the agenda is student representative update. First is City. West will be on deck. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Daniel Kelly. I'm the senior class president at City High, and I'm here to give the student update. Uh, the City High Jazz Ensemble placed fourth in the state at the city or at the Jazz Champs last week, and this is the highest that a City High band has placed at the event. So that was a good performance by our jazz band. Mock trial qualified for state in its third year of existence, thanks to the hard work of and leadership from our coaches and the members of the club. City High will be performing the musical Grease on April 22nd through 24th, and we're looking forward to that. So far, we have learned that City High seniors have been accepted to schools including Harvard, Yale, Princeton, MIT, Columbia, Caltech, Georgetown, Northwestern, and more. 
Men's soccer is currently ranked number one in the state. A rank they're fighting to preserve right now as they play Cedar Rapids Kennedy. And I'm going to end on a more serious note. Uh, Little Hawk Martin Luna is fighting cancer, as some of you may know. And City High community has really banded together to support him in this time of need. There's a pizza night fundraiser in his honor. It raised over $3,000, I believe. The Spanish club is selling shirts to raise money for him and his family. And Coach Sabres started a GoFundMe page. So far, over $20,000 have been raised. And if anyone else would like to give to this cause, they can go to GoFundMe.com slash Martin Luna. Or they can find the link to that page on Mr. Bacon's Twitter feed. Uh, thank you, everybody, and I'll see you next month. Great. Thanks, Daniel. Next up is West. No West tonight? Brady, you going to cover? No. So we're good. Is State here tonight? All right. Well, next up is the ICA update. Brady. Just a note to board members, um, you'll need to log out and then log back in on, on board docs at some point before we vote. I don't have any voting items, so we should be safe. But uh, Brady Shot from uh, ICEA, and we talked last time the legislature was still debating suppl uh, supplemental state aid, and they have come to 2.25%. Organizationally, we're um, you know, disappointed in that uh, amount, but... Um, I know there are a lot of battles that happen with the legislature, and I'd like to just take the opportunity to thank some of our friends there, I, and, and thank you. I know you lobbied hard on behalf of public education and uh, did your part. So uh, specifically, uh, Representatives Masher and Lensink and Stutzman and Jacoby, and then from the Senate, uh, you know, Senators Kinney and Dvorsky um, and Bolcom, I, I think deserve special attention and, and uh, appreciation. If you have a chance to send them a thank you, uh, we're going to do that tomorrow at our building rep council meeting, so I uh, hope that we could all do that. I think there's a lot of things we all focus, I, I probably do this as well on uh, SSA, but there's a lot of battles out there on public education, and those folks do a fantastic job for us. So thank you. Great. And I, I should say from West, too, just because it sort of does segue, uh, the Student Senate, I think they're working with City High uh, on a book drive. And sort of some of the things we've talked about and are trying to do, the students have, um, you know, picked that up and are working on that. I think it runs through April, basically. So, thank you. Great. Thanks, Brady. Next time on the agenda is community comment. Thanks to you for your interest in the community, Iowa City Community School District and for your willingness to share your comment. You're reminded to give your name, address, the topic of what you wish to speak. During community comments, persons may speak to the board about t topics relevant to the district. All community comments directed at non-agenda and agenda items shall take place at the beginning of the meeting and shall be limited to four minutes per speaker. Initial community comment uh, to the degree necessary will, will be limited to one hour. Remaining community comment to the extent necessary shall take place at the end of the meeting. To the extent you are commenting on items not on our posted agenda, the board may ask follow-up questions of speakers, but it's prohibited by Iowa open meetings laws from responding to questions or engaging in substantive discussion regarding non-agenda items. Now there's only four items tonight, only one of which is bus appeal suggest perhaps we do that right up front unless we want to hear that in the bus appeal. Open to input on that. If you only have four, why not just put it in the bus appeal and hear it when we're actually discussing it? We'll hear the bus appeal at the topic. All right. Three community comments then. First up is Allison Brewer. And on deck will be Aaron and Emily. Hello. Good evening. Um, I wasn't planning on talking tonight, but <clears throat> I went ahead and put in. So sorry if this is not as polished as I would have liked it to be. Um, I am here representing um, Southeast Junior High. I'm also a Hoover parent and a longtime Iowa City resident. I spoke at the last board meeting, too, as, um, as well. Um, I just wanted to show my appreciation for board mem member Hemingway for coming out to City High yesterday afternoon to listen to a well-attended listening post by Southeast and City High staff regarding the facilities master plan. Um, we had a really respectful and professional conversation, and I am hopefully Phil learned a lot, and we were able to get some questions answered as well. Um, one of the highlights that came out of that was um, from the guidance counselor over at City High, Tom Carey, who had done extensive research um, to look at some statistics regarding um, equity and other districts around Iowa City, or excuse me, in, around Iowa. And so he may, he may have shared all that with you, but I thought it was 
um, a good opportunity just to highlight some of those those numbers and how um, equity really does play a role and that we want all of our schools here in the school district to provide the same sort of educational experience. Um, we don't want to have schools um, that are in a um, in a position where they're not able to offer some of the same things that other schools can. Um, so I just wanted to take a moment and highlight what I kind of thought were very impactful moments from, from that research that Tom presented. So again, a lot of this came, this came from the Iowa Board of Education, and it was looking at um, changes that had happened specifically in the Des Moines school area and um, as well as um, Dubuque. So some of the things highlighted, schools they've done that have a below 50% FRL have 87% of their classmates that are proficient in reading in 11th grade. That means nearly four non-proficient readers in every senior classroom of 30. So in a school with 50% or below FRL, only four non-proficient students per class, essentially. When the numbers start to tip and the balance is, is, un, is not there anymore, in a school with above 50% FRL, 68% of the classmates are proficient readers. That means that there's nearly 10 non-proficient readers in each classroom of 30. As a teacher, I can tell you, there is a huge difference in a class of 30 of having four non-proficient students versus having 10. A huge impact on all the students. Another mention here was graduation rate. In a, in a school with below 50% FRL, fewer than 1 in 20 will not graduate. So 95.8% of the class will graduate. When we go to 50% or above FRL, we see that more than 1 in 6 students will not graduate. 83.68 of my classmates will graduate, but 1 in 6 will not. These are students that we see. These are not statistics. These are kids every day that we want to prosper, we want to educate, we want them to go out and be in our community and be active and educated citizens. I don't know how we could be okay with having schools that could possibly have one in six not graduating. Um, also, there highlights music, track, you know, extracurriculars, just the impact that FRL can have on those extracurriculars. There's lack of participation, there's lack of achievement, there's no ties to school anymore. It has a devastating impact on all the students in those buildings. And so I think, I hope Mr. Carey shared that with you, and if not, I'd be willing to do so, because I think those numbers are here from our state, have shown other school districts who have not paid attention to capacity and equity and what it has done to their community and their schools. Thank you. Thanks, Allison. Aaron Erson and Emily Agena. On deck will be Paul Rosler. I'm Erin Arneson. And I'm Emily Haina. And we are here to talk about um, bike safety and bike boulevards and how the school district can be a part of that and how parents and kids could be involved. I spoke with Phil Hemingway about this earlier in the month, about um, the bike boulevard event that we're putting on. We are students um, in the Masters of Public Health program with the University of Iowa, and we're partners with the Iowa Initiative for Sustainable Communities and the City of Iowa City to address um, bike issues in the city. And we did some formative evaluation by talking with community members, talking with partners in different organizations. And from that, we learned that community members are really interested in how infrastructure can enable biking behavior and how safety can be addressed in the city. So after learning of those two main components, um, we decided to do an event that would kind of demonstrate to the city and to parents and partners and school districts about how infrastructure can change people's biking behaviors, get them on the roads, get them active, and how to increase that safety. And so from reading several articles, dozens of articles about biking behavior, we read about bike boulevards. Um, and a bike boulevard is just a roadway that is very um, comfortable for bikers. It's really about sharing the road for all road users, bikes, cars, and pedestrians. It's low speed, low volume, um, and so it's really ideal for kids so that they can feel comfortable while biking. Um, and these boulevards can take place on roadways to schools, roadways to parks, and our event is gonna be on College Street in May um, during Bike to Work Week. And so these boulevards are really helpful for getting um, people out on their bikes and feeling safe about it, and they can involve components such as um, barriers, um, different light structures, different um, intersections, whether it be a roundabout, um, or all those different components that can kind of make that biking behavior conducive. And so we feel that the school district um, would benefit from boulevards such as this because we recognize that 
um, teachers are in high demand, that buses are expensive, and that transportation is an issue, whether it be dropping off and picking up children or parking demands at the schools, and that biking can help both make children active and maybe eliminate some of those um, issues that may be arising due to transportation. Um, we also feel that um, we know that you're accommodating bikers with your bike racks, um, you're doing bike rodeos and safety towns, and those are all great, and we just want to emphasize that the city and the community and the school districts can get behind infrastructure changes with, with the city's support mm -hmm. so that these behaviors um, can be really easy for children. And then reasons that parents and children should be interested in a bike boulevard is because active transportation via bike and walking is a lifelong skill. It's really easy to be active and by biking to school or in the future work, um, it just becomes a really comprehensive skill that can transfer over across the decades. And so we really feel like biking is a a good behavior for children to get into early. And our um, event will be just a demonstration of what a bike boulevard could look like. So we're going to have several of these different components. We're going to paint the street, use barriers so that people can feel safe from cars, educate cars about how to pass bicyclists, educate kids. We'll do um, maybe a temporary rodeo as well um, to get them to learn their skills, have people there so that they can learn how to put the helmets on, learn how to bike in a straight line, um, for children ages 10 and up, it's really good to ride on the streets rather than um, on the sidewalks because that can be a really dangerous area for people. And so we just wanted to come talk about our event and how it can really benefit the school districts by having these boulevards. And we want to advocate that people can um, make these changes in their neighborhoods and in their schools so that they can be really possible to get people biking. Um, and so we're going to leave some of our information outside. We have lots of educational materials and are happy or welcoming suggestions on our materials. On uh, We also have a Facebook page where you can message us and like us and take our pre-survey so that we know where the community is at um, in regarding to what you know about biking. And that's just um, Iowa City Bike Boulevard. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Aaron and Emily. And uh, just, a, just a second. Uh, what was the date on that event? This we put it for a May 21st. May 21st. Okay, okay, so we'll have some opportunities to discuss it more here. Yes. Now, uh, Steve, was it at, at the... Uh, Education meeting, we had a report on uh, bike rodeos and bike safety. Or I'm trying to remember. I, I, can't I believe remember. it was our education committee back uh, at the beginning of the school year. And okay, mm -hmm. and who who would be the administration person? Uh, I was just say that, it comes through Susie's office. Okay, Thank so. You. Uh, have have you uh, you guys have met? And, no, but or, I think when we talked to you, we were perfect. To well, as excellent. Well, so we'll be in touch. Now you have a face to the person. Yes. All right. Great. Great. Thank Thanks, Aaron and Emily. Paul. Hello, Paul Russler, 30 Mary Court. Uh, yesterday I was fortunate enough to go to City High and listen to the same uh, listening posts that the teachers had with Director Hemingway about their concerns with overturning the current secondary boundaries. I highly recommend, as Allison mentioned, that you get a moment to talk to Tom Carey or at least look at his uh, presentation. It was very well done. It was, it was a good one. Uh, there were several other passionate arguments presented to Director Hemingway as well, but the thing they all had in common was that the teachers were speaking based on experience. It was the teacher's voice being heard, the ones in the trenches that none of you except for Director Yates can relate to. They were asking you to keep the boundary decision that was already made the same. They pleaded with Director Hemingway to make the decision for all kids, all 15,000 kids in the district, not just one pocket of the district or the other. I ask the same thing of you. Make decisions based on what's best for all of the students and remove the personal what's best for me decisions that some people are asking you to make. With that being said, it's important that you actually make decisions. Please do not table the elementary boundary discussions as Director Liebig has asked. I read his blog today that he published earlier this morning. Not making decisions because there will be another election in 2017 really sounds ridiculous. Um, there's always going to be another election, uh, and in school boards, it's always every two years. Uh, nobody up here was elected to keep that seat warm until that next election. Uh, I don't recall any one of you on the election trail saying, elect me, I don't want to make decisions. Director Liebig says in his post that, quote, it is increasingly hard to see how we can get four yes votes on any redistricting plan by our target May deadline. I've been to almost all of these meetings on this, yet I haven't heard anyone say they would vote one way or another. In fact, there aren't even maps to vote on yet. And if and if that is part of the reasoning Director Liebig doesn't think there are enough votes to keep, then keep working at it until there are maps to make these decisions on. 
If he doesn't think there are enough votes, regardless of what the maps will be, then we have a whole different problem that involves this board probably not being transparent, something you all campaign for. I want to briefly also touch on Director Liebig's call in his blog to keep Hoover open. As I mentioned earlier, you should, that you should be thinking about this with all the district students in mind. Director Liebig has made a point to show how walkable Hoover's attendance zone is to Hoover. In a separate post, he talks about class sizes, stating how big some classes are and will be, using the weighted resource allocation model. If the goal is only to have walkable schools in this district, then keep Hoover open, and you will accomplish that. You also accomplish making sure that we have large class sizes across the district. If the goal is walkable schools and smaller class sizes, close Hoover as is planned. You will still have walkable schools, as virtually all of the Hoover students can walk to Mann, Longfellow, Lemmy, or Lucas. The closure of Hoover will free up those dollars to add teachers to other schools and help drive down class sizes. Smaller classes, better for all the students in the district. Finally, Director Hemingway, as I've mentioned before, has come to this mic many times prior to his election and criticized board members and administrators for making decisions based on who donated to their campaign or choosing companies to use that people had personal interest in. There are three of you on this board, including Director Hemingway, that willingly took money from the Save Hoover PAC during the election. I would hope that you would take Director Hemingway's prior advice and excuse yourself from making any decisions on the future of Hoover, as clearly your decisions and motives have been paid for with cash in advance. Paid for by a select few looking for an outcome that benefits only them. Remember, we are one big district, not one divided district. Make the decisions that will benefit the entire district, the decisions that will impact the students in the classrooms. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Next item on the agenda is the business consent agenda. Oh, yeah. Okay. Entertain a Sorry, motion. Uh, yeah, I'd like to pull a couple of items, please. Uh, let's see. Um, 12 and uh, let's see. No, uh, yeah, 12, 13, and 14. Just double checking Hoover East Elementary, the HVAC conditioning, commissioning. Right, right. And the uh, materials testings for Hoover and the Weber right. yeah. materials testing. Yeah. Entertain a motion. I move that we approve the uh, consent agenda items absent the three items that Director Hemingway has pulled 12, 13, and 14. Is there a second? Second. Kim, ready to vote? Oh, sorry. I should say, uh, I think Brian and I did the bills, and everything was in order and recorded correctly. And I, I just say I was happy to see 95% materials bought at many of our buildings, and that's reading uh, materials across many of our elementary. So I was just happy to see that. I found no irregularities or concerns. Thank you for having everything ready for ready to go. All right, camera ready. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Thanks, Kim. Next item on the agenda is the transportation appeals. And I think we're going to break this into three. Can I just uh, chime in for a second? Would it be useful to hear the discussion of pay to ride before we hear the transportation appeals and concerns? I know we'll be taking things out of order, but I'm kind of wondering where we stand on expanding potentially the pay to ride thing to accommodate some of these concerns. I don't have a problem with that. Does anybody have a problem with that? No, not at all. Steve, you ready to go on that? Yep. So we will do next time on the agenda. We'll be paid a ride, and then we'll come back to transportation appeal. Steve? Sure. So just real quickly to get started, uh, one of the questions was asked earlier was how the pay to ride system works and how it'll work moving forward. And so uh, we've put together uh, one page summary of that along with the application uh, and uh, I'll ask uh, Craig to go through some of that in detail uh, as he's been working with the transportation team on that. We also have in attendance tonight uh, our transportation man manager Esme Davis and uh, she's far more knowledgeable about all this than I so uh, uh, she's here to be used as a resource for you uh, board members. Um, the pay to ride uh, program um, uh, we took 
a lot of time and effort to try and figure out how best to accomplish this. Um, we heard from the board that we're not to expand the costs of transportation. Um, and uh, so in order to uh, not spend uh, the money on transportation, uh, it's, it's, um, it becomes ex extremely difficult in a pay to ride system uh, to, uh, to try and uh, accomplish uh, availability for uh, all students. Uh, let me back up a little bit and uh, frame kind of what we're working with. First of all, a decision was made on January 26 to eliminate discretionary busing uh, for roughly 1,700 students that had uh, been currently getting uh, those types of transportation services above and beyond what we required to provide uh, mandatory transportation from a statute uh, perspective. Um, based on that, then at that same meeting, uh, there was a plan presented to you uh, to add back what we call attendance barrier busing or uh, busing for those students in uh, lower socioeconomic areas that um, uh, would be uh, have those types of services again uh, provided to them by the district uh, so that uh, attendance isn't a problem uh, at school. And so uh, that added back roughly 800 of those students uh, or about 50% uh, or so of the students that um, uh, we, uh, we discontinued that service for in, in the first motion. Um, but we still have to work through a couple of um, uh, a couple of nuances there. First of all, um, as a part of that approval, uh, there uh, there are some pockets uh, of new students that hadn't been receiving discretionary busing that were also approved in that motion. There's a pocket of Horn students, a pocket of Kirkwood students, and a small area of Lucas students. Um, that we have yet to identify by address that they would qualify for this discretionary busing uh, that will begin next year. And so um, we're still in the process of doing that. And uh, so we're, uh, we're working through that to make sure that those students would have available uh, busing next year. Well, that leaves, a, that leaves a, a certain number of students out here. I didn't count them up, um, but let's say there's uh, roughly 700 students or so that uh, currently do not have um, or that was discontinued that service uh, that had it in the past. And so uh, what I heard from the board was an, uh, develop a plan and a communication plan uh, for those parents specifically uh, where they might be able to take advantage of, uh, of uh, an, another way or an option, even if it's a fee-based option, uh, in order for them to get their children to school if, if uh, that's so needed. Uh, so in uh, developing that um, and working with those constraints, um, I'm presenting to you uh, a proposal this evening or what we believe is uh, a fair balance. And just let me go through some of the items on this pay to ride and uh, uh, try and clarify what we intend to do as a process behind these items. And then uh, we can open it up uh, for discussion. First of all, uh, the program is to be provided on a space available, time available, first come, first serve basis. Participation is limited according to capacity as determined by the district and is available to students of all grades. Um, what we're planning to do is, if you approve this this evening, we'll send a letter out to um, the parents that we had sent a letter out to before informing them uh, that we were discontinuing uh, discretionary busing services. Uh, inviting them to look at this pay to ride program, okay? I heard you say that you wanted that extra touch uh, for those parents, and so we're making uh, that particular step um, as a part of what we're uh, proposing under this uh, pay to ride plan. And uh, of course, pay to ride is uh, available to anyone in the district, but I, I, was, uh, I heard from that you said that you wanted me to specifically target uh, the parents that we had removed that busing from so that they would be knowledgeable about another option, okay, even if it's a fee-based option. So that's what we intend to do is send a letter out making them aware of this pay-to-ride program. The program is available uh, on existing bus routes and existing stops. Pay-to-ride students need to go to an established stop for pickup and drop-off. 
All right, <clears throat> one of the things that we're trying to do differently this year with the pay to ride program than we have done in the past is that we wanna get an earlier indication from parents um, as to their intent to participate in pay to ride. And so down farther in the, uh, in the pay to ride um, a proposal, you'll see that we have a June 1st application deadline uh, for this group of parents uh, that uh, the discretionary busing was discontinued for. Of course, pay to ride can continue for everyone in the district right up to the, the time that we start school or even move-ins after school, right? Um, and that all continues in that way. But we wanted to know from this group of parents um, how many were planning to use the pay to ride system. And the reason why we wanted it early is because uh, Durham, our contract carrier, uh, starts all of their scheduling uh, in June. And they, they start scheduling in June and July. They roll over the system. They, they move all the kids up a grade. They, we do all of that internal database work, right? And uh, so by having the intentions of the parents and putting, uh, putting them into our database, uh, we feel that we can possibly accommodate more and be more inclusive uh, and build more capacity into the system without adding cost. Just being more efficient with the way we route buses, knowing that these students uh, uh, would like to have pay to ride services. And so that's the design behind moving up uh, the application process and, of course, the payment process that goes along with it. Buses used specifically for special education are not eligible for the program. You'll see some buses running around town with very few kids in them, okay, and you go, ha, ah, there's a pay-to-ride bus. It may not be. It may be a special education bus. And <clears throat> we have very strict rules we have to follow when it comes to accounting for the cost center of a categorical fund, especially when it's on a state and federal level uh, like special education. And we can't use a special education bus uh, for a regular ed student if we're gonna charge the whole special education cost of that bus to special education, okay? And so um, it's, it gets very, very detailed in the weeds. <laughs> we have to make sure we know who's on that bus and make sure that the cost is being allocated back appropriately, all right? So that's why we have that particular constraint in there. Bus stop locations and times are assigned by the district carrier. Uh, they do the routing. We have to depend on them as the most efficient way to handle our system. Availability of seats and locations of bus stop are, sub are subject to change. A lot of things happen. Um, you're considering boundary changes right now. We can't guarantee a bus stop will stay in the same place all year long. If we change a boundary, it's going to change how those kids get routed, right? And so we just want to make sure that parents are aware that <clears throat> if there's a change, we notify them, we give them a period of time for adjustment, and we move on. And that's how we've always managed the pay to ride program. Um, students must be picked up and drop off at their assigned location only. Uh, that's for student safety and security. It's also for liability reasons. Um, also, a request for change on a student's bus stop will only be honored if the student's uh, address has changed. You can't just tell us you want to, to be dropped off somewhere else. Um, it, it causes just pure chaos. <laughs> and so um, we have a lot of families. There's a lot of di family dynamics that happen between moms and dads, and if they live in different houses and things like that, it causes uh, a great deal of uh, problem for us to, uh, to accommodate those kinds of situations, and so we have to have these limitations. I know it doesn't feel good to have these, all these limitations, but it's the only way we can manage a system of this size and complexity. And so there has to be a few rules applied to, to these kinds of things. And so we've learned over time that these are some of the things we need to do. No guest students. I had sleepovers when I was in elementary, and I brought uh, uh, kids uh, over to my house. Uh, but uh, we can't do that for child security purposes, for um, liability purposes. We need to know who's on the bus. Uh, we need to be able to track those students. And uh, the guest student concept just simply doesn't work with pay to ride. It, it just, it, we're just not able to manage that on that kind of a daily basis. All students riding the bus are subject to rules and regulations of conduct, of course. Uh, payments can be made via online. We've, 
We've changed that this year. We've gone to an option where parents can actually pay with a credit card online. We felt that that might help um, some parents that uh, may have uh, uh, be strapped at a particular time in the month when we're asking for this payment, uh, especially since we're going to an annual payment or proposing that. And uh, uh, so we're making a credit card option available to them. And uh, we'll do that through our website. Uh, that's not been done in the past. We always required cash or a check before. And sometimes uh, we got into a position of being bill collectors. Uh, sometimes parents just simply didn't want to pay us. Uh, and we were put in a position of removing the child from the bus. And nobody wins in that case. It just doesn't feel good. And uh, we don't have a large enough staff to be bill collectors. And so uh, we wanted this to be uh, more, more simple and straightforward. And so we're asking for the payment up front. And uh, we'll be uh, making refunds accordingly. And I will get to that in a second. Refunds will be granted for any unused trimester. So if you start in the beginning of, of the school year and, and you ride for uh, you know, 30 days, and then your family moves, we'll reimburse you uh, for the second and third full trimesters of the payment that you made to us. We've already tied up that seat for the trimester that you're on, and I feel that it's economically uh, viable for uh, us and a fair way to approach uh, the reimbursement process. Uh, if you make it all through the school year and, and you uh, move as a family in May, uh, in the middle of the third trimester, there will be re no refund due you for any remaining days. We're not going to prorate this on a daily basis. That becomes way, way too difficult and takes uh, a, an awful lot of accounting uh, that we don't have the capability or the staff to do. Um, and then also, uh, the Iowa City Community School District will notify the applicant no later than 10 days after the application is due. We want to process these. We want to get them turned around. And then that way the parent uh, can know whether they're on or off and, and we can get those payments uh, in from them. The rest of this is uh, basically uh, what we're proposing for payment. Um, the yearly rate is $518. It costs us right at that amount on a per pupil basis to run our transportation program. You can look online, Department of Education. That's the amount that you'll see. Uh, the reduced rate is um, a reduction uh, uh, we do a 60-40 split on almost all of our fees, and so this is reduced in the same amount, and of course, free children ride free. Um, one of the things that you need to know, and uh, this is one of those uh, things that is not real popular to talk about, but it's a reality of pay to ride. Um, when I looked at the statistics for this year's pay to ride, we had 770 trimesters um, that were um, assigned to students uh, this year, roughly 245 students uh, making up that 770 trimesters, okay? Of those 770 trimesters, 86% paid nothing. They were all free. So if you take that 245 children and you divide them in our, if we were to put them on buses, okay, like we did, um, it, we had a net cost of pay to ride. We had a, a whopping $15,000 in revenue coming in for pay to ride of those 770 semesters, but we had a net cost to the district of over $168,000 because what you'll find is that um, our free and reduced students will find pay to ride and your paid students won't. That's just a simple fact. Craig, can I just make sure I understand mm -hmm. that? So, but if we're only using buses that we're running anyways, mm -hmm. how, does we, how do we have a cost by letting people ride for free? If I just made that, I, I made that comparison for you be, so that you know. It didn't cost us that much more okay. because we put them on existing routes. Right. But what I'm trying to you do put a number is sure. frame this that if you were to expand the pay to ride program, yeah. Um, that's exactly what would happen, and it would be an additional cost. Under this program, we're using existing routes and we're existing stops, okay? And so that's how we're controlling and limiting um, the cost to the school district. Okay, but the, the, the pay to ride that we do, we've been doing, has been at schools with high FRLs. If we were to expand it at a lower FRL school, maybe we wouldn't see the same 
proportion that would be riding free? I don't know. Yeah, it's hard to know. Okay. But it's available everywhere now. As, as far as the location of existing stops, if I'm not mistaken, in accordance with Iowa Code 285.1, we can require a student to, to walk or be transported on their own up to three quarters of a mile to get to that existing stop. Does that apply to the pay to ride as well as our regular riders? It does. Okay. I, w I just wanted to clarify that. I, I did. I'm sorry. If you are, do you want to? Do you have more? I'm done. Okay. So then, my next question was: Was that in our previous iteration of pay to ride, we did have a tiered structure for second siblings or third siblings? And my question is: um, Is that still applicable, or I see that's been removed in this proposal? Okay. So Brian, let me just can I just chime in on the first thing you said? So, <clears throat> with with a pay to ride student. You've got to go to an existing bus stop, right? Even if you're more than three quarters of a mile away, if you want pay to ride, you've got to get yourself to, to an existing bus stop, don't you? So that doesn't, that doesn't apply to pay to ride, but it does apply to the routine riders, the three quarter mile. Correct. Okay. So, okay. You want to answer that question? All right, Mr. Speaker. So go yes, for if it. You're, if you're pay to ride, there is no, Free no, limit. no, no limit, correct. I just want to make sure I'm clear on that. Just the ones that are bus eligible will have the three quarter. Right. That makes more sense. An available pay to ride spot that was maybe a mile further away, that student could still go to, to that one. So, great. I'm sorry, go ahead. I mean, I'm, I'm aligned the principle of no increased cost, like real cost, right? And the principle of maximizing the capacity utilization. Why do we need to have? And I'm aligned to existing bus, bus routes. But in the second bullet, why does it need to be existing bus routes and existing stops? So maybe even more clearly, could we eliminate the existing stops? You mean the language where it says existing stops? Well, what would that achieve? Well, if the bus is going on a route and it picks up one more stop and that stop doesn't add routes or doesn't add costs or whatever, what do we care? Now, I'll a, I'll ask Esme to answer this question. But my initial response is is that um, when our buses go out, they have a number of stops, and they're all timed accordingly. And adding another stop is going to logistics. impact. Is she shaking her head yes or no? Yeah, yes, she is. Okay, so you want to answer? <laughs> yeah. Maybe I should sit behind her so I know what I'm talking about. Okay, I, I, it, it, it becomes a timing issue. So I can buy that answer, but. You're asking people by June 1st to give you a uh, commitment. So can we build that in and? So the plan is, is for the June 1st, we would incorporate your stop if we got your payment. After that, you would have to go to an existing stop. So if we have a neighborhood that is willing to do the pay to ride and we have six kids, we would incorporate a stop for those six kids that would be closer to their home. So I'm with you and I understand. And if you could make one more stop on the way and it didn't matter, why not do it? We would, and we plan on doing it as we get the payments in. Okay. But once, once the routes are set, after the June 1st when we've received the applications, the routes are built. They are based on time. If there's time available, we have done it in the past, but it's, it goes according to time. So I just want to make sure I'm totally clear. If you, if you did a route without pay to ride, it would give you certain stops. So you're saying with the June 1st people, you will define the stops. There may be incremental stops, Correct. and then you're going to lock them in, and that's it. Yes. We're going to try really hard. That's why we move the timeline up to accommodate those requests and build that into our routing system. Excellent. And, if you guys are build that, that capacity, then I'm all in. Right. So, uh, and I just I just want to make sure that I'm clear. So we heard from a number of neighborhoods or subdivisions, if you will, that lost discretionary busing. A number of emails. I would be interested in a pay to ride option. A lot of people were unaware that we actually had a pay to ride option. But let's say uh, an entire subdivision cultivated six to 10 children who were going to ride. And that was processed before June 1st. We would potentially consider having a stop there. But after June 1, stops are set. That's the idea. Okay, sorry, sorry to reiterate and reiterate. Oh. I just want to make sure I'm clear on this. No, that's exactly what we what we'd like to have happen. In fact, uh, through this process. And I mean, the 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 mm -hmm. 
elimination of tiered pricing is that just because from a cost model it's going to be every yeah. seed is and I know as valuable a, as any other seed. I know that was a concern before so and I know with a family with multiple children that can be uh, a bit of a, a financial uh, climb Those but ASP. we also are providing the credit card option this year uh, which you know okay I understand it just transfers it from from one median to another but at the same time it does give them the ability to pay for this option to the school and and then have payments in some other venue right and this is for all schools yes so the idea is that once the routes are set they're set so they don't exceed an hour but they might be pushing the hour and then if you added stops once they're routed it trouble. becomes uh, yeah. extraordinarily difficult to make those changes uh, without being uh, costly or inefficient do you have any sense of how many people in these discretionary busing areas could be accommodated <coughs> by our existing bus routes that's why we want to get the letter out so we can get some idea of what kind of interest there may be from parents do you have any any preliminary sense of how many people might express an interest nope uh, I'd be I'd just be a little worried if it turns out you know 80% of the people who lost their busing are interested in pay to ride and we can only accommodate 10% of them I guess there's no way to know and then we get you know a couple hundred cars descending on Coralville Central in the morning I mean I just I still worry about that well but then it also opens a door for an entrepreneur to come in and do that and as it was explained at that committee meeting uh, there's no penalty I mean they get to pull into the same bus stops as the school bus is that correct Steve or is Am I correct in saying that? If you've got a, you're saying if an independent contractor does their own transportation, uh, we've got them running in the district right now. They run out at Lake Ridge. So if, if, if there was an area where there was a need for that, uh, there's nothing to stop someone from providing the service and, and doing that and then dropping off at the same spot that our school buses do. That's a great... I have a few questions. Yep. So on our current program that we have with Alexander, the uh, reduced price is $10 per child. So we're changing that now to where it would be $300. It's on I, I believe Alexander is going to be one of those uh, discretionary busing areas that you've already approved. And we'll just go back as receiving discretionary busing. Right. Oh, so the certain They're part of the 800 that already kids approved. that already have discretionary busing for next year. So anybody that's on that route, or that lives in that area, Alexander, they even if they can pay, they won't pay. That was my understanding. But some if people not might want reduced. to to pay to ride on those buses <laughs> who are not technically on the route. Is that possible? We need to get for our new kids and when I call them new kids that weren't on the initial discretionary busing uh, piece that was eliminated on January 26 we need to we still need to get the addresses of those kids okay and we're working with Joan and her student family advocate to determine who those folks are once those are determined um, as I shared with you before then everyone else becomes pay to ride it's not necessarily a geographic area it's really kind of geographic and kind of by address okay and so um, we know who those children are we've already sent the parents uh, letters saying they'll be getting busing next year but the new kids we haven't or the new parents we haven't uh, that are that you approve for discretionary busing so we still have to do that and I think Alexander's still in that great yes that that That's mode not. Okay. Hey, can you tell just, us what I'm just sorry, so yeah, I ahead. understand so there's several routes that we approved that have some socioeconomic barriers mm -hmm. um, Van Allen has one Coralville Central has one Hills has one um, I don't know if it w Wickham has one I guess um, did we approve all of those okay that's what I thought so for those routes anybody even if they can pay no those kids are already pay. in our system the, they were right. already receiving discretionary busing. We just added it back after it was taken away. Okay. But anybody else that was outside of that system, it's a pay to ride. Okay. They need to apply. Uh, can you tell us, give us some idea of the people who pay to ride? 
uh, you know, what is the proportion of people on free lunch versus reduced price lunch? It's, Aren't they widely overwhelmingly? It's extraordinarily high. Um, there's only about 2 to 5% on reduced. Okay. All the rest of the students are free. So it wouldn't cost that much to lower the price of reduced lunch, pay to ride people, because there's just not that many of them. It's your prerogative. Yeah. Hmm. So I, I'm sorry, I just want to make sure I understand. So the one student at Van Allen that's on a route that has some socioeconomic barriers, that one student won't pay, but anybody added to that route would pay. And Wickham has a route, I'm sorry, Wickham has a route with eight students on it. So those eight students wouldn't pay. Will not pay. But anybody new would be. Any additional. Anybody who's not covered by that program. And e even yes. if they're reduced lunch, they would then pay the 300 instead of the $10. Correct. OK. Just want to make sure I understand. So in essence, as these kids age out, they will We'll get the more program and more and more become, pay to write. Eventually, yeah. when we're all gone from the school district, I assume that we'll have one single system, and it'll just be a huge, massive pay to write system. Okay. That's what I was. But you, right now, you're dealing with you're dealing with a, a group of people that we removed discretionary busing from that we're trying to um, manage their circumstances through this particular pay to ride program. So right. right. Okay. All right, so Craig, you don't need any action from us tonight, right? You're just looking for general alignment to move forward. I'm looking for your approval because if you approve okay. it, then I'm going to send start sending out these letters. If if we delay, I'm not going to have time to get this done by June first. Right. I'm, 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 we're uh, kind of up against it, right? Would you like a motion? I have one more question, if I could. Um, in the transportation proposal that was presented in January, the Transportation Committee recommended that busing being be offered to families that have extreme circumstances like health issues. Right. How does that work? With yeah, in this? fact, Joan and I had a great conversation about that yesterday. And um, uh, we still have to get um, that metric figured out. Um, there are some obvious things that I believe that, you know, we can... Um, we can put right at the top of the list, whether it's domestic abuse or whatever kind of things that, that, we, that we feel pretty strongly about. But um, we still have to decide on what's going to trip what's going to trip that and how long is it going to last. Is this a, a forever thing or is this we're just going to provide assistance for uh, this family for a limited period of time while they make other arrangements types of things. And we haven't figured all those okay. details out yet, but we're working on them. Okay. And I just asked because one of the concerns, one of the um, concerns that's presented in the busing appeals is from somebody who has a health problem. Right. So I wasn't sure how we were going to deal with that, but that would fall into that category. Just so you know that, um, you know, uh, health concerns, as you might imagine, uh, a physician will write their patient any kind of a, uh, a medical letter uh, that would be in support of their patient. And so um, there's no legal obligation uh, that we honor or give any kind of deference to uh, a, uh, a doctor's opinion or medical uh, information that comes from a doctor. And we haven't in the past, OK? Now, will we, will we under the extreme measures circumstance? That hasn't been determined yet. Can I just, I'm sorry, I just want to clarify the thing you said earlier, because I didn't understand, I didn't know that was the way it was going to work. So you're saying that the discretionary busing that we are preserving is gradually going to be phased out in favor of pay to ride. Did I hear that right? For just these, for just the, the ones that these people are grandfathered in. Currently have in, in that population that we removed the busing right. from, right? See, I thought the, the reason we were preserving discretionary busing in some areas is because we determined that there would be barriers to attendance if we were to remove it. Uh, not that we were worried about, you know, the disruption of having it and then losing it. And so I guess I didn't realize that it was going to... Well, know. attendance, I mean, you're talking about socioeconomic circumstances, so they're always going to qualify for free busing, right? Under pay to Well, so, okay, right. So it's, it's not, I think you're, okay, I right. think you're thinking about something that's not going to happen, right. actually. Well, it's up to us. I mean, and I think it's going to be an ongoing evaluation, right? So um, are you so. saying that these... So eventually, everybody will have to apply for pay to ride that's currently under our discretionary busing. Well, we have to figure out those details yet. It could become a, a, a really difficult 
um, paper burden. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, what we do is the families that currently have it, we just roll them over to the next year, mm -hmm. and we may choose to follow a model like that. Uh, and then only new uh, folks would actually have to do an application. Uh, I haven't given a lot of thought to year two and three and four, quite honestly. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, there could be some changes along the way. But I'll just I was just, be a I was just following up with, with. I'll just I'll just be a little blunt. So, um, discretionary brushing is at the discretion of the board. Right. So it's up to us. Well, the only point I was, I was making is yeah, I understand your point. Well, those people are probably going to get the, the free busing anyways, but not if we're limited to existing bus routes. So that's a down the road question. But under our new system, we're trying to if they tell us early enough, okay, we're then we'll to call them an existing route oh, as many okay. as we can. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I mean, I view this. We'll have an ongoing evaluation with with Susie, you know, Susie and the whole gang, Joan and. But you're asking for approval of this year's 1617 beta ride program, especially the fee and the structure behind it and those kind of things. I just need the board's approval so I can move forward and inform parents. Well, I move that we approve the beta ride system as presented. Second. Further discussion. Okay, just one more question, just procedural question. Will you maintain a waiting list? So if, if, say, in a neighborhood, as somebody said, as Dr. Liebig said, 10% of the kids get on, but then five of them drop off, you'll contact the people next in line. Further discussion? Kim, we're ready to vote. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Great, thanks Kim. Moving back up on the agenda to transportation appeals. I think we're gonna break this sec this part of the agenda into three items. We'll review some of the follow-ups from the last board meeting. We'll take uh, community comment on appeals and then we'll talk uh, board action. So just in terms of um, on February 23rd, uh, we heard uh, transportation appeals and we tabled that item to tonight, April 12th. And uh, we made a request of uh, administration to go back and review uh, specifically entry points. There's a lot of conversation and confusion to some degree on entry points. And Kristen, I don't know if you want to just bring up that. I'm not going to go through each one, but just to show an example. Um, so at, and it's the first attachment in the uh, board packet. And um, we got a review of this at, at operations committee, and I think we chatted it quickly. but. Um, so this is significantly simpler, just wait for one to come up here, in that every building, so this just happens to be bore log, every building will have one entrance as indicated by the star. Um, if we're aligned to this tonight, we ask this to get on the district web page and perhaps add some GPS coordinates and whatever helps everybody look at this and understand. Um, so for basically every school, um, the entrance point has been uh, <coughs> indicated by the uh, star. Um, there's a few that look a little different, so Van Allen, um, and Lincoln, I'll go to Van Allen. It's a good example. Lincoln's kind of the same. It's, it's a little different because you uh, get on a, pri a pri private road. So basically the star is either wherever our property begins or you end a private road. So in this case, you end a private road. So we need to be aware of that. Kirkwood's another good example if you want to just go back to Kirkwood where it's basically where our property begins. So that's kind of where the uh, public road ends and where our property begins. So again, each and every school has one point, which I think is a lot simpler. It's easier to understand. Um, you know, what we were doing in the past was certainly aligned with the law and it was allowable and all that good stuff. It just, depending on which side of the school you lived on, it might be a different entrance and that just confused people, okay? Um, so I guess the good news is, let's share some good news in transportation appeals, is this change um, eliminated five appeals um, because they were now outside two miles, so that helped them and some of their neighbors perhaps. And um, 
well, I guess it returned busing to 28 families, okay? So I think in terms of the appeals, we, you know, we heard the concern about this, you know, the entrances and being confusing, and we agreed with that. Asked for simplification, he came back with simplification, and five appeals and 28 families are now going to get busing, so. Plus, as I understand it, uh, the, correct me if I'm wrong, Esme, but we caught a, you know, a few more people qualified for busing because we moved the stars on a few of these schools, but nobody lost it because we moved the stars, right? Correct. Because we didn't move it, you know, on the other side of the school, right. there weren't anybody that was affected by it. That's because of the way we're doing it. So, you know, people only benefited from this change. So, but, so instead of having four corners, you had one. So nobody, nobody was disadvantaged by this change. So that was outstanding. So, um, yeah, I think that's it from the last follow up. Anything to add on that, Craig? Or uh, we did go through a, a pretty extensive process of of uh, working through the adjustments of the. Uh, entry point. Um, we did find uh, uh, a few families that uh, we were able to to uh, provide busing for, and you already mentioned that. Um, we did find a few families we forgot to communicate with uh, before, and we made sure that we communicated with them uh, because they were on a private drive, and that didn't show up the first time around when we had dumped it from our uh, transportation system, Versatran, and so. Uh, we corrected uh, that error by communicating with them. Um, and so I feel like um, uh, we, we were able to uh, provide some consistency here and some transparency in how we're doing that uh, for our parents. Um, and I know that we still have some parents that disagree with us and, and that's why the appeals are in front of you. But I really feel like we've gone the extra mile uh, in uh, making sure that what, what we're doing is being applied uniformly to everyone now. The other request we had as a follow-up was to make it simple to appeal. So you uh, developed a one-pager, kind of a simple form that people could fill out and appeal. And so there was no lack of confusion around what's the process or how do I appeal. So you rolled out a new simple appeal process or how you do it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right, anything else on follow-ups? I've got one community comment on appeals. I suggest we do that now. Mm -hmm. Heather Bright. Hi, I'm Heather Bright. I'm from Shimmick Elementary. I just need a clarification one more time about this distance issue because I've followed our school bus from both routes it goes. It goes from Shimmick to Whiting to, can't remember that side street, to Caroline, to Prairie to Shane, to Linder, and when it gets to our house there, it's 1.67 miles. But then it leaves our house and it drives from our house out to Dubuque, down Dubuque, to Church Street, over to Governor, back up Governor, to Shimmick via Kimball, Whiting, Gristle. That's almost four miles. This is the reason why I'm appealing. We were appealing on a distance issue, and actually, originally, we thought it was Dubuque to Kimball up the hill, and that would have been 2.6, which is in our letter or something. But actually, I've followed the bus a couple times, and it goes all the way to Church Street. So now. I need clarification because if you took that number and you actually like divided it, you'd be in the two point something mile range. And it's based on the letter you sent me. Sorry, I have to put my glasses on. Um, in the letter you sent me, you said the basis for an official appeal arises when a school patron cannot reach an agreement on the distance between the student's district residence and the attendance center. This code often is misinterpreted by the route a student would walk to school and not the route to be taken by a school bus. Legal precedence, however, requires that this code be interpreted for the route to be used by a school bus. Well, your bus goes two different ways. That's my argument. That's why I'm here. Yep. Your appeal number? Do you know what? 12. 12, thanks. <laughs> okay, he's got it. Number yeah. 12. So that's, it and, and I didn't understand, oh, sorry, I didn't understand in this process how this works specifically, like if I'm supposed to talk to Esme or if I'm supposed to talk to you, like that's not been real clear to me how I'm specifically supposed to go about this. It's been file an appeal, but then there's been no real specifics on whether I'm supposed to do what I'm doing right now or if I'm supposed to talk to her because she's, 
in charge of this, but on the other hand, I don't, I don't know. There's not been a lot of clarity really all about this appeal. So, you know, maybe it's the squeaky wheel gets the grease. I don't know. But anyway, that's, that's all. Great. Thanks, Heather. So there you go. Oh, just a good reminder, right, Craig? So just to, as a reminder, the law is, you know, over two miles. You get busing when you're over two miles by public road, and really it's the driving distance, not the walking distance, right? So it's the safest route for a bus to take to the school. Correct. There could be multiple. Does it necessarily mean that is the route we will choose to take? It's our route. I used it's the I mean, shortest route. Otherwise, the bus would make individual routes back and forth to individual children. Instead, the bus picks up children who live beyond that, but it can pick up multiple children as long as it stays within one hour. So if you think about that, it certainly takes much less than an hour to travel two miles back and forth to a school. So the bus will pick up children well, who live farther I guess than that. as a hypothetical, you could imagine that... Uh, I'm not doing too well generating the hypothetical. I'm kind of trying to, trying to get at the question we were just talking about. Uh, it may well be that we decide, well, look, the safest and most passable route is 1.9 miles on a bus. However, you know, there's, a, there's an equally safe and passable route that we choose to take because it's a little faster. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that suddenly those people qualify for busing because the fact is the safest and most passable route is still 1.9 miles. Is that how it works? And so, so when the bus does, it, when it, you know, it's 1.9 miles to the school, but it's four miles home from school, how are we supposed to think about a question like that? Well, it's likely four miles home from school because they're transporting multiple children along that route. Depends on which route they take going back. Well, it also depends on these situations where the bus wants to let them off on the right side of the street, right? And so they have to do it on the way back instead of on the way out. Uh, so does that count as somebody who's more than two miles away? Legally under the state interpretation? No. Even though we're choosing to, to drop them off four miles right. out instead of, okay, well. Right, time for board action discussion. So we're going to act on all the appeals at once, or? We can do it either way. I, I have a question. So I'm just, as I looked at the appeals, um, I was curious why in the two cases of the Shimmick appeals, it stated the safest route for pickup is blank, which was 3.82 and 4.44 in those situations. Why was that separated in those situations as opposed to all the rest? So, like, providing you that information. So that's what the parents were saying. Yes, in their in their appeal, they have that. Okay, because I think a lot of the other parents also had routes that or mileage that they had figured as well. Theirs was through a neighborhood center. Their their neighborhood. It wasn't. Theirs was more of a walking path. It wasn't the bus pickup being on the right side. It was a neighborhood stop. Is your mic on there, Esme? Is your mic on? All right, I'll, I'm going to make a motion then. I motion to deny all appeals in the board. All, I motion to deny all appeals and complaints in the board packet. I second the motion. In terms of the discussion, a few things. Um, you know, one, again, I want to say I understand this is change. I, under, I understand the change is hard. And I don't want to minimize that this is change and disruption for our, our families. I do want to say in the past, um, sometimes these discretionary busing decisions have happened very late. In fact, I think when Brian and I started, one happened in late July, mm -hmm. right before school starting. And the board at the time said, hey, we've got to push this back and we need to do it before school ended. And um, I just want to say, you know, that's why, at least for me, I want to actively get this uh, discussion and decision out there early, being January, so people at least knew what was going on and why we want to have a decision on a timely basis. Um, and we need a decision on a timely basis because people can choose to, to make other, other appeal, appeal options. So I do want to say we at least took a, the opportunity to do this in a, 
in a timely basis. I think uh, we talked to uh, pay to ride tonight. I think that's a viable option. We should continue to look at how to you know maintain the cost there and increase the service. Um, and you know people also had the the chance to come back and talk to us about attendance zones. So you know we're talking about walkable schools and things like that. And everybody had the opportunity to come back and input on attendance zones if if a bus was their most important priority. Um, now, at the end of the day, we should just be clear. Um, you know, I think this comes down to the money. And um, we're simply underfunded from the state level, and it's a challenge for us. And, uh, you know, when you, you do a 2.25% supplemental state aid and our inflation is in the low 3%, let's just say it's a percent we're off on uh, state funding. General fund is about $100 million. A percent of $100 million is a million. So if we can save half a million dollars in discretionary busing, it needs to support the classroom. Um, and whether you, any way you look at this, we'll have more teachers in the classroom because of this decision next year than we would had we not made the decision. So um, for me, it just comes back to supporting the classroom and, um, and uh, supporting our educational mission through um, trying to either reduce our class size or control it and have it not get any bigger. So. That's my rationale. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm pretty much in agreement. Uh, I, could, I was going to hold off until we got to the concerns to get to some of that. But as far as just the appeals, which are I'm, I'm, the, the dividing line I'm using between those two things is the appeals are people who, who claim that they are legally entitled under state law to busing because they're within two miles. And... Um, you know, if if they are within two miles, they are le uh, further than two miles. They are they are legally entitled to it, but I don't feel like uh, I'm in a. I mean, yes, you you look at it on Google Maps, you get one answer. You look at it in our system, you get a different answer. You got to look at where the star is. I don't feel like I'm in any position to second guess the system that our our administrators are using to measure the distance. And so, you know. Uh, and, and as far as the interpretation of the statute, we're just working with what we understand the state interpretation to be. I find the statute to be a little incoherent, not the best worded statute ever, but there's reasons for interpreting it the way that they do. Uh, and so as far as the appeals go, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy if somebody from above tells us, well, no, we've changed our mind about the interpretation. Suddenly a whole bunch of new people qualify. Fine, you know, we'll get in the bus. But uh we're just, we're just working with, with what we understand the interpretation to be, and we're working with what our software is to, to determine and, the distance. And that's the next logical step in the appeal process, is that, is that it, if we vote to deny these 22 appeals right now, some people will choose to take it up with the AEA board, and we would be provided guidance from someone else, I suppose. But certainly, when you look at the distance aspect of it, do any of these places, are any of these addresses utilizing Versatrans, which is what the which is what Durham uses, um, are any of these places greater than two miles? No. Then, in accordance with 285.1, then we should not be providing busing. And I think the sooner that we move on this, the easier it is for individuals who wish to appeal to the. Um, the next step up, they can they can do so. I think that's one of the foibles of us not moving before was we've effectively shortened that time frame by a month. So whether they choose to investigate pay to ride and have to get something filed in the next six weeks, or whether they choose to appeal up the food chain, so to speak. In a <clears throat> in a nutshell, what's the uh, what's the Grant Wood appeal like? Not. I don't need a dissertation. I just <laughs> just want to know why, how that works. And did anyone appeal to Grant Wood after the um, issue in 2013? Uh, as far as the Garner, um, uh, uh, Lemmy, it was. Yes, there was an, an appeal to Grant Wood AEA. And roughly, what was that time frame? Well, the code's or? very the code's very specific as to uh, how that should uh, should work. And so, if anyone's interested in that, they can just read read that code. Thank you. You need to be careful not to provide advice on that, right, because that would be legal advice. And our, our legal counsel has instructed us not to provide uh, that, that Sounds advice. Sounds good. Further discussion? Kim, ready to vote? 
Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Thanks, Kim. Next item on the agenda is transportation concerns. Further discussion here? Well, this is going back to what you said. Uh, this is the harder one. I mean, the other one, we just have to figure out what the state requires us to do. Um, the state doesn't require us to provide busing to people less than two miles. We've done it before. We're still doing it to some extent. You know, a lot of the arguments people are making, and I'm just, I'm just going to work through it because I think people are entitled to, a, to at least an explanation. There, there's, there's force to some of them about the safety concerns. Uh, but, but, but the issue that I have is that I don't understand the limiting principle uh, because there's lots of safety concerns that extend way beyond the people that we have recently been giving discretionary busing to. Uh, you know, some of, the, some of the very things that people are citing as a reason to, to continue to give them the discretionary busing apply to lots of people who've never qualified for discretionary busing. We've got people in the Hoover neighborhood who are over a mile and a half away. Uh, on a 10 degree day, are you gonna send your six year old out the door to walk a mile and three quarters to school? No, but uh, they've always just had to deal with it and get the kids there. Uh, we got kids, you know, I don't, it's not quite on a par with Melrose, but you got kids crossing Scott Boulevard to go to Lemmy. You got kids crossing Muscatine and, and Burlington to go to Longfellow. Um, you know, there's other examples. They've always just had to deal with it and the problem with the with the safety rationale is you, you there's times when you it has nothing to do with distance you know you might be three blocks from the school but if there's a a big road in between uh well you've got just as much of a safety argument as as someone else does and uh, if you uh uh you know if you're a kin you've got a kindergartner five years old a lot of people just do not feel like it is safe to for their kindergartner to walk virtually any distance to school and so then virtually every every you know kindergartner in the district could make a safety argument and uh, the arguments we hear about well they're sex offenders and again that that's true for so many kids who who don't get buses and so I don't understand what the limiting principle is and so there's sort of a I guess a fairness issue uh, in not providing it to all these other people and uh, so yeah I mean it's it's we were we certainly are responsible for the safety of the kids when they get to school Parents are responsible for their safety when they're at home. When they're on their way to school, well, the state says we're not responsible. We can choose to be responsible for it, but at the end, you know, please, if, if the state gives us the money, we'd, we'd be happy to do it at some point. Uh, but you know, less and less money every year. So, I mean, that's, that's why I end up coming down the way I do. However, I do feel, uh, you know, I wish, I, I kind of wish we, we knew a little more about our ability to accommodate how many people through pay to ride busing. And if it were up to me, I would say I, at least for a year, would be willing to spring for the a few extra buses to accommodate those people, even if we had to take a, a loss to some extent on that. You know, just to back up previously, when it came to discretionary bus routes, um, they were identified kind of piecemeal. And uh, like I said, in July 2013, there was a large area that attended Lemmy that had uh, discretionary busing removed. And in 2014, Garner in particular comes to mind. It was, um, I remember walking a number of routes on Easter Sunday, uh, just testing the, checking the safety factors. And safety is very hard to quantify, but the, this action does um, apply to the entire district. This, and uh, in, in the past, as you just pointed out, Director Liebig, that some neighborhoods would not have discretionary busing or would be identified to have discretionary busing removed and others would not, that have very similar factors, both safety and distance-wise. And um, in a way, this transportation renewal between uh, discretionary busing <laughs> slash pay-to-ride slash whatever is... Um, is, is kind of hitting the reset button on, on our transportation system that has grown as the district has grown. And the district has grown significantly and things that didn't used to be incredibly costly or incredibly um, complicated have become so. And uh, I think that it's a, that it's, it's a uniform measure applied district-wide and I, 
I, I think that again the concerns are some of them are missing the maybe missing the the point and the legal obligation that we have to provide busing. So I I, I do agree that um, situations exist all throughout the district, and it's easy to look at just your neighborhood. But when you actually get boots on the ground all over, there are busy roadways that children all over the district do cross. Um, at a certain point, uh, you know, five-year-olds. Like you said, parents may may not choose to have their five-year-old walk two blocks to school. Or, you know, we talk at the work session about someday maybe having a school up in the Fox Run area. Uh, a lot of people are telling us in these appeals that it's, you can't expect a kid to cross Scales Bend Road. Well, if we put a school up there, we're going to have to bus all of Fox Run just because the school's on the east side of Scales Bend Road instead of on the west side. They might be just across the street, but... It's a busy road, it's true. Uh, so the implications of it are, are just so broad, it's hard to, it's hard to think where it's gonna stop, uh, money-wise. And you know, I, know, I know a kid who got hit by a car walking, he lives three blocks from the school he goes to. But, you know, the apron's pretty small and the sidewalk's close to the street. Well, you can have a safety issue if you're just three blocks away. I don't know where you draw the line. Other discussion? <clears throat> don't think there's any action here, so move us along mm -hmm. all right next item on the agenda is board committees and all three are up I guess I'm up first at operations uh, and if you follow the link in the uh, packet you'll go to the operations agenda pretty full agenda um, first item on the agenda was uh, pest uh, management policy had a great review we had dr. Mark shower from uh, Iowa State University come and talk to us about some of the best practices and tools available and um, you know, the, the spectrum between <coughs> chemical management and uh, pesticide-free management. Um, so we had a great conversation on that. I think probably the, the key thing to uh, emphasize, and Phil, I'll look to you since you're on the committee too, but, um, you know, the focus is on root cause and prevention. This is just how we do it in the best way possible. So I think that's the most important, irregardless of how we do it the pest management, the focus is on root cause and prevention, all right? So we always have high standards and we always want to control and uh, eliminate pests. This is just about how we do it. And I think if we always keep that common objective in mind, uh, we'll be in good shape. So we had a review of that and I think it went to policy and governance, so perhaps you'll talk it there again. I think we're getting ready to bring it to the, the board table for approval here soon. Next item on the operations agenda was the bus entrances and we reviewed that tonight, so I won't go over it again. Appendix 9 was on the agenda. We have one simple change we want to bring to the board agenda. Um, I'll just say Appendix 9 has worked very well for us, so if it ain't broke, don't fix it type of deal. So, um, But we have one small change just to uh, really um, match what we're doing today. On design and service review, um, we reviewed uh, basically merging uh, the, the taxpayer um, document that was in the packet with instruction to our contractors with Dwayne and Phil's input, and I think... Um, we're coming out with a more robust package on uh, our instruction to contractors. Um, we also reviewed the process to review design uh, process and how we review that, both cost and uh, capability elements and choosing our design folks. And I would just emphasize that we look at both cost and the capability um, index as we're picking our design folks, and it's a very robust process. On support staff, I'll just say look at the packet. It speaks for itself, but we have a very efficient um, support staff, and you're going to see in the next quarterly financial update that uh, we're very green with, with respect to our comparables. So we now have fiscal year 15 numbers, so we'll see that in the next quarterly cost review. Mid American Energy, I um, just want to say they've been a great partner. Our energy costs are uh, relatively low on the grand spectrum of things, around 7.2 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, this has been a very good rate. It makes it challenging for us to do some of the um, things we like to do, like solar or whatever, because our rate is so low. Um, but they, you know, Americans had great incentives, and uh, we've done a lot of work on rebating and got a lot of free consulting as we've uh, done work with them on the facilities master plan and our PEPL, PEPL work. We also reviewed the life cycle plan, specifically the playground, and we talked at the little last meeting as it came up on the PEPL review, um, but we're moving to the uh, district uh, defining the standard for playgrounds and implementing that equitable approach, which will include ADA accessibility, um, across the district, so that's a great, uh, great addition. Great, great for our students really to have a common standard 
keep our playgrounds uh, at that standard and in a very uh, safe and safe condition. That was it. I think next agenda we're going to be talking solar, uh, use of absolute uh, assets, cost of our schools, capital associated with Hoover, uh, management fund, and life cycle management in general, I think. So that'll be next. But a very productive and uh, very productive meeting. Tom? Um, I couldn't get my education committee minutes to open, but that's okay. Board docs, it does exactly what it feels like doing sometimes. Um, at the education committee, we met at uh, Alexander. We had a nice presentation about uh, ELL, and uh, we had a fair amount of questions uh, related to that. We also got an update on um, uh, summer school data as we come to the discussion of how we are going to uh, do that, especially in light of the uh, third grade retention programs and other things that we can expand or do to try to make uh, the entire community involved in getting kids involved in reading. Um, uh, I will move on to P&G. Um, uh, we basically did three things at a uh, policy and governance meeting last time. We discuss, discussed, as Director Lynch just pointed out, the integrated pest management policy. Um, we discussed, recommended a few changes. The policy is not going to come back to P and G for approval, but it will go back to um, uh, the IPM committee for some language tweaking and then probably just come back to the board in general. We also continued our conflict of interest discussion. Uh, Joe Holland, our uh, uh, attorney of hire, was, uh, was present. Um, we discussed uh, concerns of engaging in outside consulting, having a general conflict of interest policy, uh, disclosure of things that don't necessarily imply consent, uh, the need to define a conflict of interest if a policy is desired, and the need to know who adjudicates conflict of interest. Nice summary there, by the way. Um, really what we need, and we don't have to do it tonight, but it, you give it uh, some thought before we come back to agenda setting. Uh, on the one hand, um, Mr. Holland suggests that we do have a conflict of interest policy that is uh, specific to us. On the other hand, the state has language. Um, we do probably need to discuss it uh, as a board, as a whole, if you want more direction from, from policy and governance as to how we're pro to approach that. That is certainly a welcome suggestion. There's no huge hurry about this particularly, but it is uh, it is something that we have had a continued interest in. Um, finally, we had um, uh, Superintendent Directions F and G. We changed some language. Uh, and with those changes, all the levels have been reviewed. Um, and as it says here, rep recommended changes will be made. And these Superintendent Directions will be presented to the board for approval. And we have... Uh, made great strides in moving through that stuff in apparently a, a timely way, which <laughs> pat ourselves on the back for that. Cross-references and semicolons, right? The cross-references still don't make any sense, Director Kersley. <laughs> but <laughs> with the conflict of interest discussion, you know, we, we Director Liebig, Yates, and myself started going around with what next. And before we embarked on a great quest for what's next, we decided to ask you all what's next <laughs> because we're, we're kind of at a at a point where there's either a, a great task ahead of us or a smaller task ahead of us or no task ahead of us and we don't want to create committee work if it's not what the board wishes us to do but we're more than happy to take up the mantle of whatever charge you give us and then some great any other thing else from committees Questions? Only, only to hear really from members who aren't on P and G if they wish 
us to continue the conflict of interest discussion or they wish more details about how we are proceeding with it or what it is you want to do further direction for an endpoint to be shooting for that that, that is also thing. a possibility i don't have a need i think we got enough things on our education committee strategic plan front to, i'd prioritize over that but Well, I think a, I, I think a discussion on it is is good. I don't think we should just let it die on the vine. I think you know, uh, I think it serves a purpose to further the discussion. Now, whether you want to kind of deal with some priorities that are more pressing, I don't have a problem with that. But I don't I don't think it's something that we should ab abandon. Yeah, I don't have a problem with the discussion either. I was yeah, simply making a priority point. But sure. Well, our committee. Um, work has lightened up it's it's not that we can't continue to discuss it but we need more i mean we need basically full board direction if we're going to go ahead at this point do you want us to keep talking about it do you want some language do you want details do you want a presentation sometime down the line sure and t typically okay. in the in the way that we've done this in the past is that the um the board has taken board action to direct policy and governance committee to take up Something, for instance, um, after the rescinding the diversity policy, the policy and what was then called policy engagement committee was um, uh, directed by this table to define what what happens next. Mm -hmm. And um, so, I would say that if if that's the charge from the board that we um, collectively as a board give that charge to the committee, and it's a little strange being a member of both, but. <laughs> Uh, don't you need we like to have long discussions about whatever so well so how are we leaving are we going to put something on a board agenda to have a fuller discussion of this so we get a feeling where the board is going to i think that's probably the us? best that's probably the okay. best bet on a board a future board agenda just to say where should we go where should we go right okay okay and then the three of us can hammer it out sure and we'll be a little bit more ready to sort of present the issues to you right because i think a lot of people up here are doing a committee report you know we don't want to necessarily right, have yeah. board action right based on that sounds good anything else in committees moving on to director liaison reports Tom you're up first I'm up first okay um, I'm still I, I thank you <laughs> <laughs> uh, I did uh, attend the uh, the capstone meeting at uh, trans for at the uh, transition center and uh, they are moving ahead with uh, their own um, uh, production um, and self-promotion. There's a t-shirt in the offing and I also have some sample um, uh, brochures here. All the content is the same pretty much but the photos are different in each one which is fairly cool so um, I'll pass a few down that way and Chris you can take a look at that one if you want to take a look. Um, uh, the other thing to, uh, to point out and um, Carmen, if you would leap in with some information here a little bit. Uh, next week, April the 18th, at the Kirkwood Regional Center, we're having a, uh, or we're part of, uh, a special education program, and um, uh, Transition Center and Capsto will, will be there representing themselves. So if you've got something to add for that shout-out right now, then uh, anyway, next uh, Monday night at the time I don't have. At 6 p.m. 6 Six to eight, I think. Eight thirty, I think. Or eight thirty, okay. Yeah. Uh, at the Kirkwood Regional Center. Oh, I guess Phil and I did go to uh, Scattergood. Uh, talked to a social studies class a week or so ago. Me too, and I think Latasha too, did. right? Did y'all go? Yeah, they and I'm going tomorrow. Oh, well. capacity. <laughs> I went in a different capacity. Oh, so. okay. they invited us all. <laughs> uh, wow. All right, Brian. Just a brief meeting with the Sunrise Optimists this morning. They had a lot of good questions since we have a lot going on in the district between facility master plan, boundary discussions, budgetary things, uh, how the, de the decisions in Des Moines will affect us as the district. Loads of questions, great presentation, great group of people, long, lots of longtime community members that um, stay intricately engaged in the affairs of the district, and that's all. Just quickly on a few items, I attended the uh, affordable housing 
uh, meeting that we continue to have. And the good news is all municipalities have uh, projects occurring, um, some bigger and faster than others, but every single municipality have uh, projects going on. Um, some are senior housing, but that's certainly, as senior housing opens up, it opens up other housing for potentially our families. Um, so again, we'll continue to uh, support the affordable housing effort across the, across the county. Attended an IASB legislative update. That was right after the uh, 2.25 got approved, so we pretty much talked about that. Um, the much monthly legislative meeting, I think Chris, Chris, Brian, and Lori, I think that's right. Phil, were you at the last one? I was out. Um, and again, we primarily talked funding. Um, I'll just take this opportunity to again thank our local legislators for their strong support in everything we do. And uh, they've continued to be great partners. And Steve, I don't know if there's anything you want to add on that, but it's been outstanding. Um, and those forums have been an hour packed of uh, exchanging information. It's been very helpful. And hey, just one note, we will have, uh, we will have one last forum. Uh, we usually like to try to work with them after the session is over because uh, there's always a few last uh, minute issues that affect uh, public education. So they'll be in for one last time, hopefully after the session is adjourned for them. And then the day it adjourns, you start on the, the agenda for next year, right? So for next year's legislative agenda. I had the opportunity to attend a, a lunch on Iowa City Inclusive City, um, and it was really uh, a lunch that included many of our municipalities and looked at design elements and approaches to inclusive cities, talked about Toronto being a great benchmark um, that's, that's in North America, and um, just obviously schools play a key role in being an inclusive city, and um, I'm sure Iowa City will want to continue that, that conversation, but I thought it was a great uh, dialogue, and thank you to Iowa City for... Uh, uh, commissioning that conversation. Attended the Liberty Transition Team, and uh, you know, again, my biggest takeaway, I may have said this last time too, but there's, they continue to talk all the plans to open Liberty, and man, there's just a lot of work to do. Um, so great job of that committee and everything happened. Um, of course, Scott Kibbe is there now, so that was great. Probably sometime in the summer to fall, we'll need to talk about our role in that, and maybe a give gets with administration on what you need from us, and you know, what we're going to be involved in and not involved in. Um, so that's probably summer to fall, but lots to do. Had a quick meeting with Ryan Heyer. Uh, we can talk this primarily in the work session. Just asked him about where's the growth happening in, uh, in uh, North Liberty, and um, he's going to supply some information. Two new neighborhoods um, going up right beside our high school. That was pretty interesting. And, of course, uh, North Liberty in the southeast corner has just put a significant investment in the sewer investment. So, again, the growth as we talked about in our district, is going to be in the southeast end of uh, North Liberty, and uh, he's going to pass on some information on that, send us a few maps. Attended the Wickham uh, PTO, um, did typical overview, talked uh, high-level things we're doing in the district, and they pretty much wanted to talk attendance zones and primarily transitions, so specifically transitions at the high school level, and really a desire to get on with that. And uh, their point was really make decisions and let's get on with it so we can transition to whatever junior high we're going to. And that's where most of the conversation was at the junior high level. All right, Latasha. I was able to attend the equity committee and we were able to get a presentation by uh, Joan Vandenberg about the dropout data that we have and explaining kind of how we use those funds. Um, and so she's gonna also come back to that committee and provide some more additional information from committee members. Um, we discussed a little bit about the presentation um, that uh, Cersei Stumble did for the board on equity um, and how we could also incorporate youth voice as well as there's some discussion of being able to present to the board at a work session about how uh, equity is going and what that committee is doing and, and how else they can assist. Um, we had a parent that uh, visited uh, as public and was able to give some, a little bit distressing, I guess it's not a little bit, it's just distressing um, situations where her children are coming home and kind of talking about inequities that they're seeing, uh, racial disparities in discipline, seeing one student being disciplined versus seeing a white student not being disciplined. These are not my examples, these are examples from parents. Um, and so they were concerned about that and really wasn't sure exactly how to go about that, but had contacted the equity director and was getting some information about what to do about that. And I believe that there will be an equity walk on, is that, did that happen already? I might have missed it. These meetings are literally like the next day after this, so I have a month <laughs> in, in between them. 
Um, but we'll continue to work on that. I think some of the other concern is since we have terminated our contract with our previous consultant, um, there were some questions about, you know, the things that are brought up in the media where they are issues. And um, I guess those were not our issues. Um, and as well as what do we do now that we don't have um, that contract? So I'm hoping down the line we'll um, get some more information about how do we move forward because it is our strategic plan and our board goals to work on equity. So I'm hoping that we'll have some answers soon about what exactly we need to do and who's next. And I know uh, um, our equity director was also saying that um, he had got some additional names and we're looking into them. So hopefully I'll have some more information at the next time. Sounds great, Phil. Okay. Um, uh, first off, the scattergood thing that uh, Tom mentioned, yeah, it was, a, it was a lot of fun. And anyone else who's going out there, be forewarned, they do research. And uh, after going there, I did my own Google search on myself. So I, it's, there's a lot of stuff out there. Uh, they're well prepared and briefed. And uh, they, uh, you know, they'd been following it. And they, they had very... Uh, uh, intelligent questions, and uh, their teacher was really going into how we're uh, dealing with it. It was very interesting. Um, I did attend the uh, Martin Luna uh, fundraiser at City High, and uh, um, it just uh, that that event just really shows how special City High and the City High community is. Um, uh, they they had a live uh, Facebook. Uh, some type of communication, video communication with this, with uh, Martine, and uh, uh, it was very emotional. And uh, you know the great work that uh, our coaches and educators do with our kids, and uh, it's really special. And uh, it it uh, it was uh, it was a very good event. And like I say, there's still opportunities for the community to participate and to uh, uh, be a part of that. Um, then uh, Tom and I again were in the uh, Jay Capron show, and we tried to describe a map over the radio. So it was a uh, riveting uh, uh, a radio program. And afterwards, Jay is like, you know, we've got to come up with something else to do the next as you, time. It was one of those, as you can clearly see. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I, I took my, my big roll up map and pinned it to the wall. Uh, I, I, I should have asked him before I did it, but. Uh, put it up, and uh, so we were looking at it and describing it. Uh, uh, it could have been better to watch paint dry, but uh, it, it, you know, we we tried to inform, listen, inform listen the to paint dry. listen to paint dry. <laughs> that's right. Um, uh, then I uh, yes, I had a listening post um, yesterday with the staff at City High. It's something I'd been in the works for quite a while. Uh, it got reported as a public event. Uh, there was a person from the public that, that was in there that wasn't staff, it's not a problem. I mean, you know, we're elected officials. We listen to everybody. Um, and uh, Tom Carey, if I'm saying his name right, uh, gave a very good presentation. I have copies of it, and I would encourage everybody to look at it. Uh, he spent a lot of time on it, and it does have uh, secondary data, uh, you know, that many times when we get into that discussion, we're getting elementary data, but this, he spent a lot of time on it, and it's, it's well worth a look. Uh, I got there at 3.15. I didn't leave the campus of the school until 5.45, uh, so there was a lot of, a lot of questions afterwards. Um, and and there, there were concerns. Uh, I wrote some of them down, and then, then I was, you know, to, you know, they were talked about, uh, since I was there, I guess I, I, I take it uh, it was they were talking to me that uh, I was short sighted, stupid, and narrow minded. I think narrow minded was mentioned more than once. But uh, then again, not all the teachers spoke, so you know maybe there was some other opinions more stronger that didn't get shared. But uh, no, it was it was very uh, productive. I felt it was helpful, and uh, encourage other board members to go and meet. Uh, I did meet also with the uh, the students that presented here as well on the bike effort, and I think that that's something we should help uh, promote and everything. It's a uh, it, it fits in with our blue zone, our getting kids active, and and also uh, coming up with alternatives to tra uh, car transportation to our schools. I also met with uh, Habitat Restore and uh, discussed with them some some of the things that were dismantling the bleachers at City High and the temporaries out at West High. And I did talk with Duane before the meeting on it and everything, and, and I'm hoping it's a type of a thing that 
when we have assets uh, that have no value to us, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have value to others. And uh, so they, they expressed an interest in it, and Duane ex uh, expressed uh, an interest in cooperating with, with, those, with those people as well. So it's something where, you know, hopefully we can try and get an extra use out of some of that stuff, repurposing it and recycling it and reusing it, so. Sounds great. Any other liaison items? All right, next item on the agenda is the agenda setting process. Chris, you asked for this one? Yeah, you know, uh, just because I don't fully understand it and certain aspects of it kind of bother me. And so I don't have any great solution, but I just wanted to see if anybody else had some of the similar questions. So with, with putting things on the agenda, now of course at the end of the meeting we have an opportunity to put some things on the next agenda. My sense is that Ordinarily, if one person wants to put something on the agenda, it'll go on the agenda. I guess in theory, it is a board decision, and if someone wanted to push it, it would require four votes to put something on the agenda. I mean, am I wrong about that, do you think? No, it's a board decision. I mean, normally silence is consent, so if somebody says they want something and um, nobody disagrees, we normally put it on. But so then in between meetings, it's, it's useful to have a way to, to get things onto the agenda that maybe you couldn't have foreseen at the previous meeting. Uh, but then it's not a board decision. Um, now I understand that if the board has decided we're gonna follow a particular schedule of reviewing this sort of, this sort of policy or whatever, well then I don't have any objection to, it's just a ministerial decision at that point for, for, for Steve to put stuff on the agenda according to our plan of how to review things. Uh, but when other things come up between meetings, how, who decides whether it gets on the agenda? Now, suppose I think of something between meetings that I'd like to put on the agenda. You know, uh, there's no way to pull the board at that point because you can't pull the board without having a meeting. And so, <laughs> kind of, you know, it's really catch-22. I guess the way we have it set up uh, that the decision is delegated to either uh, Steve or the board president or and or I guess but I'm not fully understanding it and if if it has to be a request received after the deadline it says may only be added to, for good cause well that's talking about the deadline for getting things on the tentative agenda which is what we look at at the previous meeting I'm just not sure on how things get added to the agenda and what the criteria is and who decides in between meetings I mean, really, we follow administrative guideline 220, right? I'm looking so, at it. Yep. But again, I, maybe I'm not reading it right, but it seems to me like that's addressing how to get things on the tentative agenda, which I assume is what we look at at the end of this meeting when we're deciding what goes on the agenda for the next meeting. Yeah, I think it's the same. I think in general, it's, same. you know, when we're doing the agenda setting here at a board meeting, um, you know, as you mentioned before, if somebody were to bring up something that the other six go, oh, come on. Mm -hmm. You know, then right. we could put it to a board vote and say that's not going to be on a future agenda. But in between meetings, um, unless there's certain instances that, that that you're thinking of in particular, anything that gets added tends to be time sensitive and related to district business that needs to be taken care of. But I mean, if I think of something two days after a board meeting personally. Um, I would wait till the next board meeting to bring it up during agenda setting mm -hmm. so that the agenda setting is done here. Okay, but I guess part of me wonders, part of me wonders against, about this against the background of the Open Meetings Act. If putting something on the agenda other than sort of things we've already scheduled to be put on agendas is a, an act of the school board as it seems to be when we're doing it at meetings and requires four votes, is that something one person can do in between meetings? Normally, things that, you know, board action is not something one person could do. Even four people couldn't do it between meetings because you'd need to call a meeting. So where, does, where do we stand with that? And, you know, there does seem like there have been some things that have come up that at least the, the urgency has not been clear. Um, you know, one example, we, we uh, just a couple days before one of our education committee meeting was the seventh grade football issue was put on the agenda. I, I don't think it's something we put on the agenda at the previous meeting. And, you know, who decides uh, whether that's something that, that, that should just be put on the agenda without a vote or whether that should wait? 
I just want to understand how it works. You know? Yeah, I mean, granted, if I think it's, oh, I think it's something two days later I wish I'd put on the agenda, oh, well, that's my fault, you know, unless it's really time sensitive. Um, but there might be times when it makes sense or when you see something that's on the agenda and it makes sense to have something else on there with it. I think what know? makes sense is to go through the board president and the superintendent to go to them and, um, and see what guidance would come from, from Steve uh, regarding that for when we do ex uh, executive committee. Or uh, when it's committees, it's the committee chair. Exactly. So well, but at the same time, if it's a, are we allowed to delegate board decisions to an individual? Is that something we can do? The and answer is, is literally there yes. There's, there's, no requirement. there's no requirement for the board to collectively create the agenda. Well, if that's true, then why do we need four votes at the meeting to put something on the well, agenda? Well, again, it's just practice, right? So... I mean, if there's four members that say they want something not on the agenda, then four members can do anything, right? Not between meetings. But there's no legal requirement. And we talked this when we, we onboarded. I mean, there's no legal requirement for us to set the agenda. It's up to us to set the boundary conditions. The past board was very strict on agenda. That can be fine. If you want to be very strict and only we set it, then there's going to be times where tomorrow something comes up. Oh, I understand. And you got to wait be. a full month because you got to wait two weeks for the next meeting and... Now, my question to you, would, what, what's the problem we're trying to solve or what's not working with the current process? Cause well, I, it worries me a little bit if, if one board member can put things on the agenda between meetings, but other people can't. I mean, personally, I'm very selective. When people approach me, I want to understand, is it timely and why is it, like, really important? So even Steve, he'll come up with things and go, you know, I don't think this is that timely. Come on. And we'll have that conversation, let it wait, and move on, but there's other times where it's like, oh no, this has to go now, and that's probably where we have the most leeway is on operational items. I mean, Appendix 9 is a standing item, but you know, we don't talk the specific items we're going to talk. Some of your SBRC stuff, we don't exactly know. You know, sometimes we're getting guidance from the Department of Ed, and it might be ready, it might not be ready, so there's a lot of operational stuff. But normally that's also very timely. You need a quick turnaround, so again, I, I'm not sure what problem we're trying to solve, but well, again, you know, again, those are judgment calls, and you don't know how someone's going to make them. Uh, but I don't want to go on and on forever about it. If I'm the only person sitting here wondering well, with these questions, let's just move on. I guess I'm curious, are there instances where an individual board member is outside of this meeting of the board is getting agenda items put on? Well, I mean, the chair or the chair of a committee. Could, you know, it's sort of up to that person to decide, well, this is, this is the time sensitive enough to put on. But it's not happening like every, I mean, is this a frequent occurrence that? No, I mean, uh, I just, I don't know how it works. You know? Now, the other thing I, I understand. you know, we've done as a practice, Steve will ask to put something on us, like, fine, but you need to t email everybody and tell them what's going on and, you know, a little bit on why. Steve needs to email everybody. Yeah. Now, if I'm adding something for some reason, I'll email you and say, hey, we're adding this, and here's why. Now, as an individual board member, if you go, geez, man, I, I, I absolutely don't want that. Reply only to me. And if everybody replies only to me. Okay, but individual board members don't really have that ability in between meetings to suggest that something be added and poll everybody about it. No, nope. that's no. just the way the system is. Now, the other thing is, if I add something and you go, man, that was the dumbest thing ever, we get into the meeting, you table it. Yep. And four people can table an item, so. Um, Chris, is, is part of it, even though we know pretty much what the sections are, that there are items here or, or things that seem to be surprises every time you look at the... Um, every time, but there's been times when I've wondered or times when I've thought, gee, I wish I could get this on the agenda. I'd like to get it on the agenda for next week. Uh, and I guess I have the ability to, to ask Chris if he thinks that's time sensitive enough to put on. Um, it doesn't sound like anybody else is concerned about it. So. so speaking of time sensitive, I do think we should move on if there's no... I just have one quick question. So, like, for instance, today we took off um, the showcases. So how do we, and I got an email about why, I think. 
Um, but how do we make that up? Because, for instance, there was a group of kids that really wanted to come and be a part of Showcase. Like, how do we make that up? Because from my understanding was that they couldn't do it this month and they couldn't do it in May. So it puts them in June, which means that they're not going to come in June. So, like, how do we make that up? Because right now we're sitting at 8 o'clock. We have a couple more items that we need to do, and that's a five-minute kind of showcase. I just feel bad we disappointed, like, 20 kids over five minutes. If I could if I could just step in, one of the things we did is we worked with them uh, and created an alternative opportunity for them. So they're actually going to be on uh, with Hani al Qadi on Education Exchange. Mm -hmm. um, so we worked with them, uh, and they thought that was a great opportunity for them because they can actually bring some video in and put that uh, – uh, he can feed that in. So then it goes out online, and if you know his show, it's out on YouTube. So um, they were excited that they get a half an hour with him instead of five minutes with us. So – we found another alternative for them so they don't have to wait till next September. We can definitely bring them back next September, but we wanted to create an outlet for them today. And I know one of the things that the board had said was, and we just talked about this last week at the, uh, the committee meeting, was can we get done by 8 so we can actually have a, a meaningful work session? And, and there was some concern about that. And so we said, as an administrative team, are there things that we can pull off the agenda to make sure that we can try to keep it for you as tight as possible uh, in order to try to meet that 8 o'clock goal so that you've got adequate time for the work session. Now, has anybody told them they can't come in May? Pardon me? Has anybody told them they can't come in May? Because I don't know where that's coming from. We already had one scheduled in May, and so we were looking for other. We were looking for another alternative for them, and so that's why we uh, found that opportunity with Hani to get them on right away. Because Steve made the ready. recommendation, I'll be, and I pushed back on it because I, you know, I didn't personally want to change the agenda. I think we should do showcases. Now we didn't get into the details of this item, but I actually pushed back on having it and. Well, about the showcases, I mean, they are what, I mean, indeed what they are, which is, you know, showcasing uh, achievements. Um, there have been a couple, I mean, when it says showcase sometimes, I mean, some of that has been a surprise. And it's been fine, but it took it took 20 minutes to do the, uh, to do the all-state musicians, basically, and uh, all their directors were organized and ready to go. It still took 20 minutes. Well, I didn't know it was going to take 20 minutes. Uh, it would be nice to know it was going to take uh, that long. The other thing that w that we don't know, of course, uh, and I'm not sure if everybody's hugely interested in are either the committee reports or the um, or the liaison ones, but that's another time gauge kind of thing based on what it is we we have to talk about. Um, I had more to talk about about P and G because we had something there. I whipped through uh, you know education committee. Um, and I know we only do that once a month or every other um, uh, time, but uh, I, I, and I, and again, it would be impossible probably to set time limits on the stuff. But on the other hand, you know, maybe the question ought to be: uh, Is there anything outstanding from the committee or anything from uh, from a director or about a liaison that uh, absolutely needs to be reported? Maybe it's a priority thing. Does that help? Sure. With those types of things, I'd be fine if there was just a paragraph that we could read in advance and and then just say any questions, you know, instead of reporting them all out. But that's a different question. It's an idea. I do like the idea. I mean, if we're going to talk agenda setting, I would love the objective being what's it take to have a two-hour meeting? Because I do think, you know, sometimes you're going to have your four-hour meetings, but it shouldn't be like every time. I think it would be better for the, us and the public if our meeting was about two hours. You could still have an hour work session and be done by nine. I mean, I'd be all over that. We could certainly talk that like a board retreat type topic. Or yeah. Okay. Well, let's. I mean, why don't we add that to our next whenever we're doing the team building or board retreat? And yeah, you know, <clears throat> it's a matter. It's a matter to uh, perhaps it's perception. I mean, we've got one set up here. Um, uh, if you're in the audience, you don't necessarily know what's uh, important or not, or not, depending on what's going on. And the the other thing too that everybody has to remember is, until all seven of us are up here, there are things that we cannot talk about. Um, so, so the the question I was asked this months ago by by a constituent said, "Has the board talked about this yet?" And I said, "Have you heard us talking about it?" No, well, then we haven't talked about it because we can't talk about it until we're all together. Oh. Um, 
you know, it, it wasn't it, it wasn't a stupid question. It was more of a procedural one and, and a, certain, a certain amount of ignorance, perhaps, um, uh, about that. But you know, stream. Uh, there's a conflict between streamlining our work, which we have to do as a group, and making the agenda look. Uh, doable and figuring out what's on there that, you know, sometimes looks like surprises. Um, oh, we're talking about that, uh, which, you know, is also uh, an aspect of time. We get the agenda um, five days before the uh, five calendar days before the meeting, and it's probably about the last time, I mean, really a sensible time, that we could do it. Uh, if it comes out earlier, then right. there might be stuff left off. If it comes out any later, we're in, you know, we're in the weekend and we're in trouble. So, All right, we'll add this to a future board, board retreat. Anything else on this one? I just want to say that by my silence, I'm not disagreeing with you, Director Liebig, sure. um, that uh, I also share your concern that... Um, it would be nice in uh, situations where we would like to have something discussed um, that we didn't think of in time to get it on the agenda for the following meeting, um, or if we feel like it's more timely than that, that it wouldn't be just the discretion of, of um, the superintendent the, uh, and the president of the board, because um, they may disagree. And right, and you know, there's the sliding scale over what's something urgent or not. Um, part of what weighs on the other side is, well, it's going to take a longer meeting then, and it's, it is kind of a call that different people would make differently about whether something should be added <coughs> in between or not. So, And, and I'm not suggesting I, that I know the answer of, of what how it should be changed or, or different, but, um, but I, I understand what you're saying, and I think it's a valid concern. Just, just one quick one, and yeah, um, like on tonight, we suspended the superintendent report, and uh, when I got the email, it was probably already a done deal. Uh, so as far as if I, because I would have liked to have kind of entered into a discussion on some Grantwood AEA things, uh, but uh, you know, if we've got the option to to tell you, well, we want to try and cancel it. I don't know if there's. Something else, because we don't all check. I, I know for myself, I don't check my email, but like going to the mailbox once a day and and uh, that. So good to go. All right, Craig, it's your time to shine. Next item on the agenda is the 2017 certified budget. Um, yeah, Mike might help. Um, in uh, refining uh, the budget after we receive the 2.25% uh, uh, um, uh, state uh, supplemental assistance, uh, we were able to reduce our tax rate, which um, I mentioned to you uh, was a distinct possibility. Uh, we reduced the tax rate by seven cents per thousand and uh, which represents just under seven hundred thousand dollars in uh, in taxes so we're actually reducing our tax asking from the public by a total of six hundred and ninety one thousand two hundred and sixty one dollars the tax rate is being proposed instead of the uh, four point oh six percent it's thirteen point nine nine cents per thousand which is a, a twelve cent increase instead of a 19 cent increase as originally uh, proposed and published. So all of that, um, good news, I guess, for uh, us to come back this evening. Uh, we do have a hard deadline of uh, April 15th in order to certify our budget. And uh, so action is uh, required from you this evening. There's a very specific motion, yep, please make it. I move to adopt the fiscal year 2017 certified budget with total requirements for all funds of $273,085,618 and a proposed taxation rate of 13.99071 per 1,000 taxable valuation. 
or a second? Second. Well, Craig, thanks. You said it would go down about seven cents, and I went down about seven cents, and thirteen ninety nine. Perfect. Yep. Further discussion. Kim, ready to vote? Well, uh, can, can I just uh, chime in? I mean, this is more of a comment, not about specifically this budget, but just looking at the future. Um, it seems to me that you know. A lot of times we're in the position like we are tonight of telling people well, we can't give you what you want we're going to cut discretionary busing we're going to cut this we're going to cut that and we say look you know it's, it's either that or class size there's a lot of times the way we end up putting it and people come back and say well i don't know if that's true i don't know what else is out there that you could cut and i don't know either and uh i just feel like maybe over the course of the year not you know not now on this one of course but uh it would be nice if we on the board could see what the administrators have to look at when it is time to cut things. You know, we went through those cuts in 2014, and, you know, there were that, that, that budget had to be looked at in a more line-by-line -line kind of way, more broken down than we're seeing here, in order to figure out what was going to go and what was going to stay. And I feel like, you know, we never, we never get to see that uh, and that it would be useful if only so that we would have answers to those questions about how, well, really, this is what we have to do. And so I'll just toss that out there for the future. Further discussion? Kim, ready to vote? Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Thanks, Kim. Next item on the agenda is Pennix 9, Dwayne. Thank you. <clears throat> we have seven projects with nine requests this evening. Uh, the first one is a step five or approval of construction documents for the athletic fields uh, that we're doing at, East, at City High, and that's going to go out for bid later this month. Uh, and those documents, as always, are available at the physical plan office if anyone would like to see them. Uh, City High Edition Phase 1, Step 9, Substantial Completion. That's actually Part 1 of Phase 1. There was a Part 2. Remember, we had an exterior shell and an interior. This is for the exterior work, and I anticipate the interior uh, request will be shortly. Uh, as far as I know, all the punch list items have been completed, and we're in pretty good shape over there. Uh, at Liberty High School, we have a Step 8 change request for $91,351. The bulk of that, 49000 almost 50000 is district request. We added some audio-visual work uh, in the student commons, some flat screens, uh, some hookups for that, and some uh, public address type uh, setup so that we can give lectures and those type of things in that, in that large room. Uh, we also revised the concession stand, and we made some, we had some winter work related to getting that bike trail done last fall. We had some code request uh, changes to the fire sprinkler system, and we had some unforeseen conditions with steel beams, supports, and ductwork uh, where they just kind of collide, so we have to make revisions. Uh, at Lucas, uh, step seven, award of contract. Uh, last week we received seven bids, and they ranged from 4185 to 4594 There was only $9,000 difference between the low and the second low, which is pretty encouraging. Uh, and we're going to recommend that we award a contract to Tricon Construction of Cedar Rapids in the amount of $4,195,000, which includes one alternate to upgrade the electrical panel. Uh, roof management, uh, we had a contract change or amendment with the uh, consultant. We had him do some additional work at Corville Central when he decided to do the rest of that roof. And also had them uh, supervising some of the roof construction at Liberty High just to make sure that that was getting done properly. Probably a good thing because we had an incident this past week at West High where we lost part of a roof, uh, which was done back in 95. So, I mean, it's, it's time, but it's just a really important thing to pay attention to and get the details right. Uh, West High uh, Athletic Improvement, that's uh, actually a credit for $2,000. We deleted a water line, so we'll take it. And at West High, phase one of the renovations, as you know, we've been talking about the tennis courts. Uh, the drawings are complete. They're in the office. And this, again, will be bid at the end of April. So with that, I'd recommend approval. I move that we approve the appendix nine items as presented.
second. So, question, if I may. So on the uh, West High tennis courts, it says the description is six tennis courts, but do I understand correctly that we've still asked for an alternate bid that would include right. eight? There's, there's actually three different alternates <laughs> for three different configurations. The base plan is for six courts, but then we have an alternate for eight courts. We also have an alternate for adding lights to the six courts or lights to the eight courts. And there's an alternate to use asphalt or concrete for the base. So there's quite a few of them we'll have to consider. But I'm yeah, sure we'll be able to get it in under budget. That one's going to be an interesting one, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, uh, I guess I didn't hear about the loss of the roof at West. Can you explain it, give us a little more info on that? Oh, sure. Uh, there's a section of the school that's immediately to the north of what we call the ninth grade center. And there's like eight classrooms in that section, maybe nine and uh, was built in 1995. The, the wind came directly out of the west, northwest, kind of really kind of open there. There's nothing sheltering that building to the northwest, and we had some 70, 60, 70 mile an hour winds two weekends back. And what happened was, uh, it's like a lift. The, over time, the adhesive between the rubber and the insulation, I think it started to kind of go bad. And when the wind hit that, it was like an airplane wing, and it actually lifted the rubber off the roof. And it was making some noise on a Monday morning, so our custodian rightfully went up there to see what was going on. He said that roof, that membrane was five to six feet off the deck. So it was kind of billowing up and down. We actually went up there and put uh, plastic bags full of water. You know, they weigh like 200 pounds a piece, they're like 40-gallon bags. And we put maybe covered half the roof, and a couple days later, it's still going up. <laughs> So we added some more. It also damaged some roof drains, uh, and it just needs to be replaced. So we've got a plan in place to do that in April. Uh, April 21st or 22nd, we're out of school that day, and then the following Saturday. And we've made, Steve and I have made a request to, or Steve has, to the Area Education Agency to get an emergency declaration so we can do that without a competitive bid and just get it done. Uh, there Are there any other... Uh roof issues at West? Uh, there is. On part of the media center, we, we made some temporary repairs there. We're confident that they'll they'll stay until we get to the renovation of that. But that roof's getting, there's some parts of that roof have been replaced. We replaced at least two sections since I've been here, but basically half the building probably yet need to be replaced. Okay. And, uh, and if I could, just on, a, on another note, I noticed in accounts payable there was uh, uh, two thousand plus dollars for door closures at Alexander uh, was that uh, ones that went bad or are we adding or no, we added some okay yep very good just going back to those tennis courts so that that choice among those options because it comes back to us at some point yes it should be uh, the first meeting in May with a recommendation yes yeah okay yep so Dwayne it's great to see the big projects come in on target and so Lucas is what I'm talking about here um, was that in line with where you thought it would be and, and yeah, it, it looks a little tighter to me than normal a little yeah. on track any concerns there it's doable uh, but I would have preferred it to be a couple hundred thousand lower probably just to give us a little cushion uh, but I think the scope is pretty well defined there there's no additions it's just it's a geothermal system New windows, uh, a lot of new finishes, exterior walls, the paneling, the siding, that's going to be replaced. Plus, the big addition there is is actually flipping the art room with the office. And if you know where the art room is, right inside the front door, but we've decided that's a better location for the office to make the building more secure. So we're actually doing a small addition by small. I mean, it's like 12 by 20 to make to finish off the space. Uh, put an office there and then put the art room back in the, where the teacher's work, work room is. And they'll actually have a very nice art room that looks out into that courtyard where our ducks hang out. Great. They, Sounds so, good. I mean, that, those, that's the major part of the work there. Great. Thanks. Further discussion or questions? All right, Kim, ready to vote? Online voting is open. Then the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Thanks, Kim. Next item is items withdrawn from consent, Phil. Yeah. Um, you want to just you, we go through them one at a time? Uh, it's up to you. We can, yeah, we can real quick. Uh, or at least the we can do the. Uh, 
excuse me, let me go down here. So do I have to go, I have to go back up to the consent area? Yeah. Um, okay, on 12, um, in the, uh, in our uh, committee, operations committee, we got a list of, of our vendors and everything, and we had a had a good discussion on it and everything. And again, I'm just going to uh, urge us to uh, to bid it competitively uh, instead of just an award uh, that way. That's I know I'm plowing the same ground, but I'm just putting that out there. You're talking about number twelve. Yes, a number twelve. It's the HVAC commissioning. Um, at our operations uh, committee, and I, anyone who is interested can go to that report. And uh, Dwayne provided us with a list of all of our firms. And uh, for for this, we have just two listed. Correct, Dwayne? Actually, I think there's three. Uh, there, well, yeah. it's, it's commissioning firms. We've got Cadent, and then Systems. System works, but also in addition to that, McKinstry and Shive Hattery does that kind of work. Too. Oh, okay. So this the lower list would be involved as well. So we've Most got five. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I would just encourage us to competitively bid it and and uh, make sure that we're not just giving all the business to one firm. And, and we have in the past, uh, we've kind of moved forward with this one particular firm because they're doing a really fine job uh, and they're independent. And we like to have somebody that's not competing against one of our design firms so we can get our true independent look. And this, for those of you that don't know, this, this commissioning is required by state energy code to be done. Uh, what they require is a basic level commissioning. We're actually doing what we call enhanced, where they actually check out every system. We have so many energy controls and heating and cooling controls and all these and occupancy sensors and things like that, and they all have to work together. So we actually do what we call enhance and have them go through every system, every room, every heating and cooling unit. So it is a little more expensive, but uh, we had an issue, frankly, when I got here, bore log, it just wasn't working the way it's supposed to. And this kind of ensures that we're getting what we're paying for and that the building works. And what, and what was the vendor that did bore log? I honestly, I don't know who they did the commissioning okay. on that. It was already done when I got here. No, I understand, yeah. but I think it's important that we Keep have that ha, have that present when yeah. we're when we're going forward. And to be honest with you, I don't know if it was in place in the energy code when that when that was done. Right. Okay. A agreed, but nevertheless, right. the, the problem was the problem I, was there, and we had to incur it. If we could, if, I think if, we're. I think you've got I, it. I, I Truth be known, I don't think it was commissioned. Excuse me. Truth be known, I don't believe that there was any commissioning done at that building. Right. I don't. I, I agree with you. Yeah. We, we've learned from experience this is pretty good value. So, all right, next one. Or do you want to do a motion okay. or next, whatever? I, I, okay, move that we uh, approve this or go forward with this. Number 12. Is there a second? Second. Kim, ready to vote? Online voting is open. All votes have been cast, and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. All right, 13, maybe 13, 14. 13, together. 14 together. This, uh, and, and uh, Craig and Dwayne responded on this. I, and my concern is, is that, you know, we're, we're uh, we spent some money with uh, Shive Hattery to get a construction standard very early on. Mm -hmm. And we have design firms and architects that specify the materials we're going to use and they're supposed to be guaranteed 100-year products. And we have contractors that come in and are supposed to put in what the architects recommend and <coughs> we're supposed to follow up and make sure that they do it. And, you know, uh, I know I know the schools that we built are, are house uh, everyone's most prized possession, their, their students. And uh, and that, but uh, it just seems to me that it, it's uh, uh, kind of an extra cost that you know when you're talking about do we really do we really need that? I mean, we're inspecting welds and and bolted structural components. I mean, those should have been uh, 
put in in excess of of uh, you know what what is necessary. And I mean, we're 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 building uh, schools on flat ground. We're not building bridges over raging rivers or nuclear power plants. And I, I, I just I just wonder if you know we really have to have that level of of uh, testing. Well, I assume you want my opinion. Right. <laughs> Well, I, I think we do, and the reason is you know, we, they do design to, to a certain level in specifications. What this does is guarantee that the concrete that was delivered by the concrete company when it cures out actually tests out at a certain PSI. If, it, if you'd specified 4,000 pounds per square inch and the contractor who put it in decided to, to add a little water to it to make the job easier and it tests out at 2,000 pounds per square inch, there's no way of knowing that without doing a test cylinder and putting it in a machine and doing the actual compression test at 28 days to see if it meets standards, for example. So they do, re they do a daily test on the concrete when they're pouring concrete. That's really important. And I get, I get notices every day of past samples that have been tested. And every once in a while we get some that has a deviation or didn't meet specs. And so we have had contractors go back and replace some of the concrete, if it's not, doesn't meet our standards. As far as the soil part, uh, I haven't found a site in Iowa City yet that has what I call <laughs> really good soil. I mean, everywhere we go, and if you were at the groundbreaking, which I know Mr. Hemingway was last week, you saw big drill rigs out there putting in what we call geo piers, and they compact that gravel in there. Well, we have that tested because it has to meet a certain pounds per square inch to, to support the building. Uh, the contractor says they're doing it right, but this makes sure that they are. The, the architect has said this is the standard, and, and the contractor is obliged to do it, but this is the test by an independent agency that says, yes, it's being done correctly. Soil conditions, footing conditions, liberty, we had all kinds of issues up there, and I'm glad we had them. Now, when you get the structure going up and you have steel bolts going in and you have iron workers out there and a lot of it gets welded, the building inspectors won't accept the responsibility for that. They act, the cities will actually require that we have an independent person test those connections, welded and bolted. So they do that as well. They also make observations on the steel going up. It's it just, and again, I guess it's a good insurance policy to make sure that our buildings are being put together the way they need to be put together. And it's pretty standard practice. Every major project I've been on since I've been here, we've used them. I would encourage you to keep doing it. Excuse me? I would encourage you to keep doing it because it, it takes a certain amount of liability off a lot of different people, particularly the owner. But doesn't it fall under the scope of the builder? The builder's obliged to do it to the spec, and I guess if you want to trust them that they're doing it properly and... Well, you, couldn't, couldn't our contract language require them to? Then it's then they hire who they want and it's not independent. I would prefer that the person testing the materials out there is independent of the contractor and independent of the architect design team. Their responsibility is the owner and only the owner. Entertain a motion. So moved. Second. So the motion is to approve consent item 13 and 14. I'm ready to vote when you are. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. All right, last item on the agenda is agenda setting, 26th. I think a few of these items we need to get in the right area. So Tom, I'm checking um, integrated pest management policy. We're sending that back to the, to the IPM. Yeah, sort of scratch to the that. IPM committee. Yeah. So it won't happen next yep. meeting. I think okay. actually it should be ready to go. They actually put an ambitious schedule in place so that they'd be ready to go on the 26th. No, we right. still, yeah, we still have, yeah, we, we meet next Monday. Right. And, and there, uh, I think, yeah, we've, you can leave it on if you want well, to. Yeah, your there is a request for approval of the policy yeah. at the next board meeting. If you're ready, great. If you're not, it'll be a right. quick topic. Yep. Okay. Just want to check on that one. 
Number two, where it says academic achievement, is that, uh, is that to present the results of this year's? Yes. Assessment? Okay. That'd be under teaching and learning. A few things we need to get in the right spot, but. Oh, get that moved. I'd like to add superintendent evaluation, which I'm sure Steve will ask for a closed session, unless we need an exempt session. So if we need an exempt session, Jim will let us know, right? Depending on negotiations, that's the first priority. But if we don't need that, I'd like to do superintendent evaluation. We also have a closed session that we'd like to propose prior to that uh, regarding uh, property. Uh, as we're moving forward uh, in the North Corridor, we, uh, one of the things that we still have to deal with is a property swap issue on the Scanlon property. Uh, and so we hope to have that uh, firmed up and ready for you. So you want that next meeting? Well, we, we better do we, that first then. We would need to do that. We need to do that as, as soon as possible. We won't be ready next week, but hopefully by the 26th we'll be ready. So we won't do superintendent evaluation then if you need we that? We need to do the property piece. Unfortunately, that's very timely right now. Okay. So that'd be 515? Yes. All right, anything else for the 26th? I'll have a work session, attendance zone. 26th, um, I, I wouldn't mind putting on an item about, and I don't know what the right label is, uh, but you know, you, you, the, the letter that I'm gonna discuss at the work session would, re if there's any agreement with it, would entail possibly altering our kind of plan for what order we're going to do things in and when. And if there is sentiment for it, it seems like that's something that we'd probably want to do at a board meeting and not just at a work session. We're really making a decision about changing a course, you know. And so uh, it seems like it might make sense to put an item on the agenda if we need it for that purpose. So a tentative item called attendance zones? I mean, does that cover the territory of, you know, we've got this plan to do things in certain order, and if we're going to rearrange the plan, it's, it's more than just attendance zones. It's the facilities master plan. It's kind of the schedule of what we hope to achieve. It's a topic to be later after the work session. Maybe. There you go. But, yeah, but you get the idea. you the intent. Yeah. yeah that's Anybody good misaligned with that? It's fine. Got it. Do we want to, or is it we just want to put it off, uh, re revisit the conflict of interest thing at the next meeting, or just want to wait? Why don't we decide in the work session? I think we can keep it on deck or in the parking lot. I, I'm, I'm indifferent. It sounds like there's interest up here from the board for about discussing it, but I'd, I'd say that might be a wonderful summertime topic. <laughs> yeah, there's some big uh, reports here. Okay. Just looking at them. All right, work, the work session would be attendance zones, standard agenda. Anything else in agenda setting? Entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Work session will proceed in a few minutes in the back room. Did we say 10 o'clock?